or record to the, to the, to the cloud. Yes. So, uh, yes. Hi. <laughs> so welcome everyone. I'm, I'm uh, good morning. I'm really happy to welcome you here to our West LA Democratic Club candidate forum series. And this is number three. We've had the sheriffs. We have had um, council district five, and now we have two assembly districts and uh, LAUSD. So on behalf of the board, I wanna say we're very happy to see you here today. Um, I don't know how many are on, but can the board members, um, can, you, can you not spotlight me for a minute and see if we can see the board members can raise their hands? Um, maybe we can just do the whole, because I, can, I cannot see everyone. I see Mark Salzberg, member at large, who will be our timer today. Uh, Michelle Morton, who is our Zoomie today. <laughs> She's taking charge of all the tech, so thank you. Uh, Julie Goodman, who is our, a member at large, and Julie will be also doing the timing. Um, who else? Who else is on the board here? I cannot, I can't see. Francis Penn, who is our esteemed uh, leader of our senior advocate group and also will be celebrating her 100th birthday on Tuesday. So yay, let's give Francis a huge round of, of applause. And Francis, put your makeup on and everything and come on so everyone can see you soon, okay? Okay, so um, Tracy Gore is here. Tracy is our membership chair. Soon to depart on to uh, new digs, actually. She's moving. She's been with us, I think, since 2013. You all know her. She's amazing. We're going to miss her very much, but hopefully she will be bringing someone up who will also uh, also doing, doing it. So, okay. I think I don't see anyone else on my board. If there is somebody else, please put it in the chat and I'll acknowledge you. Um, Susan Blanchard. Oh, Susan, Susan's here. Susan Blanchard is our treasurer. Thank you, Susan. We have to like coerce her every election to stay on, but she does a wonderful job and we really couldn't stay afloat without her. Uh, I have to say, and I think you all agree that we all are heartsick about, about what's going on in Ukraine and seeing all these images is truly horrifying. They, they, they just, they, they bring back like these old newsreel photos that we saw so long ago and that we see all over the world, but to have it happen it here, I mean, pandemic, war, you know, devastation, climate change, all that's going on now is just really hard. I, I think we all need to, to take a breath. And, and what I would really like to do is to take a moment for us here to kind of close your eyes for a minute and, and we can send a, like a collective bubble of hope to them to these brave people in Ukraine and to the people in all the war-torn country. I mean, I, just a moment. Because if we all do it, they have to feel something, yes? Just across, across with our energy. We're, we're so fortunate to be where we are today. And I, I think it makes me anyway, take pause and reflect on my own problems with a real different perspective and through a different lens. If anything, it's given us that, that gift. Um, the board has voted uh, this week to send a donation to Ukraine, and we're still researching the best avenue for that. We've been looking into the Ukrainian Cultural Center, but if anyone has contacts over there, family or friends, um, or a really good donation site that you know that's real, would you please put it in the chat or contact me, president at wladems.org. That's president at wladems.org. And uh, we'll see that this donation gets over there. Thank you very much. Whew. So we're excited to be presenting all of these very interesting and qualified candidates for the various offices. And we here, we consider it our community service. We really do. We want uh, you all to have the most information you can. So when you go to the polls, you'll make an informed choice. Uh, we do often have an embarrassment of riches. And if you've been to our last two forums, you'll see that no, no one has yet achieved the 60% threshold for endorsement because the competition is very stiff this year. 
So good luck today. Uh, we'll be having several more forum meetings in the coming weeks. We're going to have two congressional races, the mayor, the supervisors, CD11, city controller, city attorney, community college board, and the superior court justices. So it'll be a few packed weeks, but so very important for all of us, as you know. An informed vote is a good vote. Uh, we had our, our mayoral uh, council district 11 forum in the works for March 26, moderated by award-winning author and executive director of the American Prospect Magazine, David Dayan, and who's also a club member because our candidate interview committee from LACDP is holding meetings all that weekend to hear from every candidate running for LA city and county office. It's gonna be quite a weekend. As I said, I'm on this committee and we, we had no idea when the scheduling is, so we had no choice but to reschedule our meeting. We are looking at possibly next Sunday, March 20th from 10.30 to um, probably 1.30. 12.30 or 1.30. So please hold the date and check your mail for announcement. I hope we can get this. I've got a few of the candidates confirmed um, and I'm working on the others. I just heard there's another uh, a forum in the Palisades that day at Mayoral and perhaps others. So I'll coordinate with them and see what we can do. Okay, so that said, I'd like to acknowledge any candidates in the room. Um, I gotta get off. I can't because I can't see the, uh, the gallery. I see, I see uh, our candidates today. I'm going to wait for you because, well, you say Angie's here and Tina and Robert, and um, I see Greg Good who is running for. Um, here he is, Greg Good who is running for Council District 11. Oh, boy, that's going to be quite a job. Good morning. And, uh, as you all know, Greg was previously a. Uh, political vice president of our club. We served together when I was uh, political vice president of operations. When I was vice president of operations, he was political. So he's been with us for a long time. Um, I did see Chelsea Byers, who is running, where's Chelsea, for city council. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks West for being Hollywood. here. Yeah. West yeah Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. There's Chelsea. And uh, anybody else in the room that I'm missing? No? Well then, okay, that's that's good. Please just put it in the chat if you if you are here so we can acknowledge you. Um, okay, so now it is my great honor, and I and I do mean this, uh, to introduce Assemblywoman Laura Friedman. Um, from the minute I met Laura and became aware of her work, I think I was sitting in, in I think it was at a convention, and we were out in in the um, outside area, the seating area, and she was talking to, I believe it was Mike Levin, and I was just sitting with them and just, you know, kind of just sitting there, and I was so impressed. I, I just thought, my goodness, this is the kind of a, of an elected that we all need, you know, she was just, just so, you know, just so knowledgeable and so clear, and it just, I became a big super fan from that minute on. She's a social justice champion, which is as evidenced by her legislative focus. Um, she addresses housing affordability and the homelessness crisis, protecting vulnerable communities in a big way, and combating climate change, which makes her the perfect choice to be chair of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee and chair of the Bicameral Environmental Caucus. At least she was. I'm not sure what's going on in this new session, but and also as a steadfast advocate for the environment, sustainable communities and active transportation. In 2020, Laura was appointed to serve as chair of the Assembly Committee on Transportation. I wanna tell you, this is vast in scope. It was, I thought, I cannot, I cannot read this. I cannot quote all of this. Please go to her website, check out her bio because it's really impressive. And DMV is under there also. And there are long lines still. Laura, you need to do something <laughs> about that. <laughs> and, um, and then she's also chair of the Joint Rules Subcommittee on Sexual Harassment Prevention and Response. She's thoughtful, she's caring, she's careful, and her votes are sound. I, I, I love this woman. So let's welcome 
Assemblywoman Laura Friedman. Oh my goodness, Kara, you're gonna make me yes. you're making me blush. And right back at you. I am such a fan of yours and of this club. And I want to thank you for inviting me here. It's really an honor to be here. And I want to also say to the candidates, I know how hard you're all working. I know the toll that running for state office and local office takes on your lives and on your emotional health. And so I wanna thank each and every one of you for participating, being part of a thriving democracy. And I just, one, one thing I wanna to say to all of you is be sure that in the middle of all this, you take a little time to take care of yourself. So don't forget uh, you and your family. Um, so I was asked to speak just for a few minutes before we get to the, uh, the questions and the forum. And I'm so excited to be asking all of you questions. It's fun to be able to ask them and not answer them for once. Um, so I, you know, the, I guess the sadist in me is looking forward to that part, but I'm looking forward to learning from you more than anything. So thanks again for everything you're doing. Um, so I have been in office in the assembly since 2016 when I was first elected. And prior to that from 2009 until 2016, I was a city council member and mayor of the city of Glendale. And I focus, as Kara said, on really on three main uh, areas. Um, the, one being um, sustainability and climate which I consider to be a hugely existential threat. And I um, do a lot of work um, to try to really find ways for California to be a leader in combating climate change and living in a way that it's more sustainable and in tune with nature. I was chairing the Natural Resources Committee where I got to lead our efforts with regard to habitat protection, uh, biodiversity, wildfire, clean air, um, CEQA, uh, so many other areas that are really exciting and in which I continue to work. And now chairing transportation, it gives me a great opportunity to try to push forward one of my other goals, which is to de-silo issues that we tend to think of as being different issues, uh, but which really aren't different issues, which are issues that are um, intertwined to the point where you really can't tackle one without another. And those issues are climate change, transportation and mobility, housing, and the way we use land. Uh, because unless we find ways to live that are healthier, more in tune with nature, that um, allow us to have mobility to the places we wanna go without causing widespread environmental harm, we're not going to be able to um, have all the things we want in California, which is uh, an environment that is uh, air that's clean, um, uh, neighbors that we know and who we respect because we encounter them every day, um, to, not, to, to not have sprawl, to protect our open spaces, to have enough housing truly for everybody, and housing that doesn't require people to commute for hours every day to get to where they live, to, to where they work and, and shop. So I'm trying very hard in my work to find ways to bring that concept into policy with the way that we fund transportation, with investing in mass transit and active transportation, with making sure that we tie housing to land use and, um, uh, create housing near job centers and um, to create urban environments that allow us to interact with our neighbors of all sorts so that we look them in the eye and really get to know them instead of isolating ourselves in areas that require us to be in our cars that are segregated from, from different communities um, and that um, are just not sustainable. I also work on what I consider to be regional issues primarily on, on housing and I do quite a lot of housing legislation and homelessness, and I've tried to do a lot also in the homelessness space, um, again, transportation. And then lastly, vulnerable communities. Uh, you know, this is looking for people who are, uh, ha have needs that aren't being met by the state and who often aren't able to advocate for themselves. So I've done quite a lot of work with foster youth and poor foster youth. And this year we have two pieces of legislation to support foster youth who are our children. I did a bill last year about charity care in hospitals and making sure that people don't go bankrupt um, and have their credit rating shot because hospitals neglect to inform them of the charity care that they're entitled to by law. Uh, mm -hmm. This year, I have a very exciting legislative package that runs the gamut from requiring schools to notify parents of their requirements to safely store firearms and keep them away from young people. You know, given that right now, firearm death is a leading cause of children, believe it or not, followed only closely by uh, traffic violence and traffic accidents. So letting people know that if they have a gun in their house, it's not secured, that there is a chance that their own child might use it against themselves or others or accidentally discharge it and kill somebody. So um, we're working on that, working on, um, again, foster youth bills, uh, foster youth. We have a bill about college coaches who've been convicted 
or you know, or, or who were known to take bribes um, or commit harassment themselves to make sure that they don't just move to a different school and set up shop without any repercussions. Um, we're looking at um, uh, driver's licenses and how sometimes just not paying a, a, a fine can lead to a driver's license suspension that can cause somebody to not be able to get to work, you know, cause their lives to just unravel because they can't pay a towing fee or a driver's license fine. Uh, we're in the environmental realm. Um, we did a bill last year that successfully banned the use of dangerous toxic PFAS chemicals from children's products. I'm a mom of an eight-year-old. I had no idea that so much of the clothing that I buy for my child or put on her bed has been soaked in these chemicals that we know are carcinogenic. We passed that bill last year, and this year we're working on a, a similar bill to ban PFAS from being intentionally put in personal care products. Yes, it's put in your lipstick. It's put in your skin cream. So that's, you know, another very important area that we're working on. Uh, a lot of sort of big bills that work to, to connect sustainable community strategies with transportation funding, um, active transportation to make sure that we put more money into it, getting people around safely out of their cars. And what we call our, our Omni Bike Bill, which uh, reforms a whole lot of uh, laws to make it friendlier for people who want to ride their bicycle around their communities. Um, we have a bill that we've introduced again for the second year. We weren't able to get it through last year that would require online shippers to phase out the use of non-recyclable plastics and polystyrene. Hopefully we can get that through this year. And then lastly, last year I was able to um, pass a bill that's been a long time in coming and reforming how cities are forced to set their speed limits based on accommodating speeding drivers. Uh, we've given um, our municipalities more tools to cap speed limits or even lower them in some conditions. And this year we're working on a bill to allow for automated speed enforcement in high injury networks or in areas near vulnerable communities with a, an eye towards equity and fairness and making sure that this is done in a way that truly lowers speeds rather than uh, being punitive. And we've built a whole lot of, of very, I think, thoughtful equity measures into this legislation. It's very important considering that our traffic deaths from uh, for pedestrians and cyclists have gone up almost 30% in the last two years. And that's while people are driving, why, while people are driving less. So we have a public health crisis when it comes to traffic violence. And it's very important that we give municipalities the tools to truly work uh, holistically to lower speeds. Now I wanna get to the candidates. So I'll just see if there's any quick questions anyone has, and then I wanna move to our, our the reason that I think all of you are here, which is not to hear me, but to see these amazing candidates. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has a question, I guess you can throw it in the chat and I will um, try to answer. Uh, Someone asked about the gas tax and I don't want to really want to answer that right now because that's a question that I have for the candidates and I don't want to be leading at all. Uh, and I, I'd rather leave it up to them. Um, somebody asked about coaches at the federal mm -hmm. level. We can't do anything about federal, the le federal level, but we can set up a registry of coaches that have either been convicted of or have left universities because of um, uh, taking bribes or committing sexual harassment. And so we're working right now with the universities and stakeholders to figure out a way of doing this that's fair, that gives people a, a second chance, you know, because we do believe in, in redemption and people doing their time and, and coming back, you know, and being able to work again. But we also need to make sure that there is accountability and that colleges know when someone's left their university because of credible sexual harassment or bribery um, complaints. And right now they don't, they don't know. And that's why sometimes these coaches end up, end up failing upwards, I would say. So we're working with them on that. Um, kids who have lost a parent to COVID, uh, you know, super difficult. Now I believe that this year, Nancy Skinner did introduce a bill um, exactly in this space. So I don't know the details, but I know that she is looking at some sort of way of supporting um, uh, children who have been traumatized by or lost you know, uh, parents because of COVID. And I, I will say that I think any child that loses a parent to whatever uh, a reason, or if they've certainly if they've lost both of their parents do need the state to support them. And that's why I've been working on foster youth support for a number of years, particularly for foster youth as they emancipate out of the system. And uh, given that they have a very high statistical chance of becoming homeless right after emancipation or ending up in our prisons, uh, that's definitely an area where we need to have a lot more resources. These are often very traumatized uh, young people at a pivotal time in their lives and that support goes a long way. So I, I think I don't see any other questions. And so what I will do is I think turn this back over to somebody who's yeah, going to give us the yeah. ground rules for the forum and then we'll move on to the questions. Yeah.
Yes, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. So we have our candidates here. We have Angie Reyes English, uh, who will speak a little about herself, but just to let you know that she is on uh, the City Council of Hawthorne. We have Robert Pullen Miles, who is uh, currently the mayor of Lawndale and who was formerly the district director for um, Autumn Burke, Assemblyman Woman Autumn Burke, uh, whom they are running to replace to fill out her term. And we have Tina Simone McKinnor, who I've known for years and years and years, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who has uh, worked with so many of our electeds. Um, including Steve Bradford and Rod Wright is here and um, is always on there doing the good work. So uh, when we start the forum, candidates, you will have two minutes. This is like a two, two, two today. Something happened to Nico. I don't know where he is, but it gives you all a little extra time then from what I have blocked out. We have an hour for your forum. So uh, we're going to give you a two minute opening and then you have a two minute um, you may answer the questions in two minutes. You don't have to take the full two minutes. If you can get to the point clearly, take just as every time you need up to the two minutes. Uh, the more time, the more questions we can get. We can even take some from the, uh, from the, the guests if we have a couple of extra minutes. And then a two minute closing. Mark Salzberg will be your best friend today. He will be your timer. So he will be giving you a one minute warning, warning awful you know and a 30 second and we should practice that now so you don't get jarred sometimes it's you lose your train of thought when you hear that but it'll be one minute 30 seconds and then thank you or stop or whatever mark so you want to let's hear your voice mark one minute maybe you can just 30 say seconds stop. okay so maybe you can just say one we don't even have to have a minute. I mean, just to not not be so. <laughs> one one it is. One and thirty. Okay, great. All righty, that's it. Any questions here on the timing? I think you're fine. Look at that Tina background. Who is that girl running? <laughs> Very good, Tina. That's a good idea. I like your balloons, Robert. <laughs> okay, so uh, Laura. Great. And so what we'll do is um, if you can all remember the order and what we'll do is each question, I think we'll kind of uh, switch the order up. So we'll start since you're on my screen that way, we'll start with Angie, then Robert, then Tina. And then the next question, uh, Robert, Tina, Angie. So if you can all remember the order so we don't lose time with me trying to remember because I will forget. So my first question is not. Oh, I think you're all having your one minute opening first. Correct. OK, so is Mark. It, yeah. Two minutes or one? I heard two and then I'm hearing oh. one. No, the two one minutes. is two minutes. Okay. Okay. So two minutes. We'll start with Angie, then we'll go to Robert, then Tina. Angie. Thank you so much. Uh, fellow Democrats, Angie Reyes English, longtime Democrat since age 18, mother and grandmother of seven, born and raised in Idaho, uh, as Hawthorne City Council and City Clerk, senior district representative in the state assembly and state senate, and senior field deputy today to Councilman Curran Price, who I've been with for 16 years. I know the ins and outs of our state and local government. For decades, dec decades, I've been delivering results to improve our communities and I'm ready to keep fighting for our neighborhood. We deserve a leader who has the right priorities and can deliver on them, and that is me. I look forward to the opportunity to be your next assembly member. I've again dedicated my life to delivering results that improve people's lives. As a Hawthorne council member for 11 years, I know what it takes to get things done listening, communicating, and more importantly, delivery. I've helped build affordable housing, create jobs, and I have addressed homeless solution, uh, uh, homeless issues. I could also per, uh, have worked on protecting One. public safety and I have, and, and move on, excuse me, be, uh, beyond COVID-19. Again, uh, I'm 100% proven uh, through my electability as the only Latina in the race, a mother of blended, uh, family, Black and Latina. Uh, I look forward again to representing the diverse community of the 50, excuse me, the 61st Assembly District and um, look forward to the debate. 30. Thank you. Okay, Robert. Okay, good morning, Democrats. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I'm honored to 
honored to be before you. My name is Robert Pullen Miles. I moved to California when I was 19 with $25 in my pocket, looking for new opportunities. Little did I know that there was a strike difference between the cost of living in Oklahoma versus California. As a result, I found myself to be homeless for a while. I spent many months uh, sleeping from couch to couch of friends of friends, and I actually spent a night in the city of Compton behind the local Wendy's. So I can really appreciate the housing crisis that we currently are experiencing, as well as the homeless crisis. So those are some issues that's really dear to me that I will be working on in Sacramento. As a council member and mayor, I would have you to know that I have delivered on the most important issues that are important to our families, and that's high paying jobs, protecting our green space by opening three new parks in our city, improving our city's infrastructure. And of course, when the pandemic hit, I was one of the first mayors that authored a resolution one. of ordinance to protect uh, our community. As a district director for Adam Burke, I have worked on constituent services, so I know how to work on constituent services, including EDD and, and DMV. If elected, I would work on improving um, the homeless crisis, restorative justice for our children, fighting for good paying jobs and protecting our green space. I'm endorsed by the Democratic Party, as well as Ask Me Local 1865, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Ted Lieu, Ben Allen, Supervisor Dennis Hans, and a whole host of elected officials and community supporters. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Tina. Good afternoon, Democrats. My name is Tina McKenna. I've been a registered Democrat um, since I was 19 years old. The first president I actually voted for was Walter Mondale. I've been voting Democrat ever since. I got involved in the Democratic Party after seeing Rodney King get beat by several police officers and never getting one day of jail. I decided to get involved after that. I called Congresswoman Maxine Waters' office. She was hosting a rally for a young man running for president, Bill Clinton. Um, she asked us to go out in the community and register voters. I did that. I started registering voters everywhere. This was 1992, and that was the beginning of my love affair with the Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat because I believe in climate change, women's right to an abortion, same-sex marriage, single-parent health care, low-income housing, immigrants' rights, and police accountability. My top issues are housing, transformative justice slash police accountability, and immigration, One. and women's right to an abortion. Thank you. My name is Tina McKenna, and I'm asking for your support. Thank you so much. And, you know, we have a certain amount of time. So the shorter you all are, the more brief you are, the more questions we get in. Now, this first question is not going to be a two minute question. This is going to be just a 10 second question for me for each of you, which is in 10 words or less, how would you describe your political brand? In other words, who are you in just a few words? What is your flavor of politics? And we'll start with Robert. My flavor is very um, um, caring. Of course, I am a coalition builder. Okay, great. Tina? Progressive, scrappy, fighter, faith-based. Love it. Angie? The most sincere and dedicated public servant to the people, the people that matters most. Great, you guys did great with that. That was a tough one. I knew I just threw that curveball in. <laughs> okay, now we'll go to the normal questions because uh, we all want to get to know you all. Okay, what are your top priorities and why? And I'll start with Tina. My top priorities are the priorities I've been working on in the last three years, housing, because we know we have a homeless um, problem and we have a housing problem, immigration because our undocumented folks didn't have a safety net during COVID and transformative justice and police accountability because we know that our folks coming out of jail and prisons need to have a humane way to get back into the community. And we know too bad we have to uh, legislate police accountability. Thank you. Angie. As formerly being homeless for two years myself in a car with my family, my priorities would be homelessness, uh, finding uh, solutions, more importantly, protecting uh, our communities with a strong public safety, uh, hopefully uh, also include um, vetting out those bad actors in our police force, but more importantly too, uh, move beyond COVID-19. And uh, I would say housing, job creation and economic development. Thank you, Robert. And of course, mine would be, of course, as a, a formerly um, 
homeless person myself, a person who experienced homelessness, obviously homelessness is the top of the issue. Restorative justice for our, for our children, we're talking about taking the, the racial disparity um, out of justice system um, for our children, so that's a top priority. And of course, helping our, our community continue and our families continue to recover from the pandemic. We still have a lot of families that still one paycheck away from, you know, from being out on, on the streets or finding themselves at risk of homeless. So that's gonna be a top priority as well. Thank you. And starting with Angie, what is your position on single payer? Is that the right way or is there a better way? Um, and would you support CalCare when it comes up again for a vote? Um, I support single payer. However, I think there's more information that I need. Uh, I really need to understand how that's gonna be funded. Um, I, I support insurance for all. More importantly, I'm working that now with uh, Telehealth Van providing uh, covered California insurance to those that were reaching out in the homeless community. Um, and your other question, I'm sorry, was? Whether you would support CalCare, the, the bill that was up this year that didn't come up for a vote. Yes, I would do that. Okay, Robert. No, I do not support single single um, payer. I do support a universal um, health coverage for all, the governor's um, proposal. My, my question with universal, with the um, single health payer, payer system is how are we going to pay for it? We do have a system for whereby we can provide universal coverage for all. And the governor's proposal has lined, outlined those proposals and I'm in support of, of that proposal. Okay, Tina. I support single payer health care, um, and I would I would have voted for the bill that came up. Um, as you remember, uh, Democratic uh, partners like Cara and Mark Salzberg, we've been uh, fighting for single payer for many years. I remember when we were at the Westchester uh, in Westchester at a rally with Congresswoman Maxine Water talking about single payer a couple years years ago. And so mm -hmm. I still have the same debate. desire to um, see oh, everyone okay, have health care. It's a human well, right. Do it yourself, Rod. I do believe health care is a human right. So yes, I, I do believe in single payer health care and I would vote for it. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and if anyone um, else is listening who's not a candidate, please mute yourselves. Um, last year, there were two very controversial bills that passed, SB9 and SB10, that were meant to create more housing um, equitably in single family neighborhoods that traditionally have been uh, often redlined. Um, did you support those bills? Um, uh, yes or no? And you, you know, elaborate a little bit on that if you like. Uh, we'll start with, I think Tina's up first. <laughs> Yes, not only did I support it, I, I, I used my, my position uh, working in the nonprofit with the clergy across the state to support, to support SB 9 and SB 10, but I also support building low income and affordable housing on faith-based with on faith-based pro property. I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Angie. Uh, so for the, uh, here in the city of Hawthorne, uh, our issue was local control. I support all housing, work, live, mixed use, um, I also support affordable and all types, uh, medium income, et cetera. The question was here in our city of Hawthorne whether or not it would have uh, adequate space. Uh, so there was a, a letter I believe that was sent with regards to the concerns of local, local control. But as far as housing goes, I support all housing. Okay, Robert. So what I do support, I support of course, building housing opportunities on major corridors and transportation um, hubs. In our community, that would be Hawthorne, Hawthorne Boulevard. I do not support changing the makeup of residential communities and having it so densely populated with communities such as Lawndale where there's no parking at all already. And then you change, all of a sudden you have a, a, a one story, not one story, a one structure on a unit. And now you have 10 structures on, on, on a unit without any parking consideration. But the idea of providing affordable housing and more opportunities Yes, those should be on the major corridors. And so I support the efforts of having more housing opportunities on our major corridors, in this case, Hawthorne Boulevard. Thank you. Um, did we start with Tina last time? I think we did. Okay, so Angie, this question will be starting with you. What can we do better in terms of our fight against global warming? What would be your strategy to combat this crisis? Um, in my opinion, I think there has to be an educational component to it. It has to be broad and wide to those especially that don't speak, read or write or understand the language. Uh, I think also in a local community such as mine here in the city of Hawthorne and in the 61st Assembly District, 
There has to be more uh, transparency and an e even playing field when it comes to who benefits. And what I mean by that is similar to environmental justice. If folks want to, uh, you know, be able to drive a um, electric car, how are they able to do that if their affordability is not there? If they want to be able to, say, for instance, put solar panels on their homes, how are they there? How are they able to do that with once again when the affordability is not there? So for me, um, it's it's a combined effort, and it would be an educational component, but there also has to be incentives and programs that provides for those, and that would be my stance. Okay, Robert. Can you give me the question again? I'm sorry. Sure. The question was, what can we do better to fight global warming and what is your strategy to combat this crisis? Well, one of the things I, um, I, I would suggest that we um, fully implement transformative um, communities um, uh, initiatives. Those types of initiatives will allow the local communities, whether it's community-based organizations, to partnership with municipalities or other um, organizations to do projects that will reduce um, greenhouse emissions. Now, these projects could be anywhere from, from tree planting um, um, programs um, to um, educating um, the community on um, re re reducing their um, fossil fuel um, uh, consumption. But it starts really with the community, with the education um, of the community, and then holding, of course, um, those um, bad actors and bad polluters um, responsible. We have to hold them responsible in legislation and regulatory uh, um, actions. So I would definitely go after those bad actors in addition to uh, allowing the communities to have um, programs for which they can have um, built these programs that's unique um, to their communities, whether they, they're next to a freeway uh, or what have you. So that would be um, one of my solutions to, um, to that issue. Thank you, Tina. Yes, I think we, we must move, uh, move away from fossil fuels. Listen, we need the, the electric car companies to make more affordable electric cars and not just, just electric cars, good electric cars that'll last. And also they have to make uh, batteries more affordable, the repair to the uh, electric cars more affordable. If we get the affordability to drive these electric cars, we'll be able to move away from fossil fuels and we could, we could start just getting away from gas cars altogether. I believe that we can go we could be almost 100% electric cars if we have the car companies really working on making these cars, uh, uh, making them unaffordable and making and, and also building up the infrastructure in our community to, to pump, to, to pump, not pump, but to charge our cars, right? And so one of my suggestions I had was to build a, a full electric uh, a parking uh, uh, structure at the, at the new stadium where people who came in can charge their car, and then the community in Inglewood could charge their car for free. One. And so that's that's the type of um, thing we should be doing is moving away from fossil fuel. Thank you. Thank you. And starting with Robert, now I'm going to ask a couple of questions about homelessness and housing. So this okay. won't be the one. The first one is over, um, ho uh, homelessness is the overwhelming issue that's really been decimating our urban communities. Why has it gotten so bad? And what is and is not working? Well. What is definitely not working, I'll start with that part first, is not taking people that are homeless who find themselves in these, these precarious um, positions of being homeless and shuffling them from one community to the next, you know, or harassing them in such a point where, you, where um, they have no place to, to, to stay, but yet you criminalize them. That has not worked. We have not provided enough emergency shelters, bridge housing, um, and wraparound services for our homeless communities. And that's have to change and we have to make um, significant investments through the budget process um, to make sure that those dollars are there for the local communities to reach out to the homeless um, population and provide those types of, type of services. That has not worked. I think that has, what has made it worse is the fact that, that we're not getting um, the mental um, treatments to those that are homeless um, we, we're treating it as yeah. if it's a criminal offense to be homeless, but we should concentrate on getting mental services to our homeless population. That's what really has, has made it worse, as well as the economy um, in, in general and the lack of um, um, job opportunities for, for um, folks. Some families are just a paycheck away from being homeless, and that speaks to the lack of, of job opportunities. We need to attract more businesses in the state and retain those businesses that we do have and make them accountable to having living wages and health benefits 
great health benefits for our community. So folks won't find themselves on the, 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 the brink of being homeless and they won't experience this crisis. One thing we should also institute is a trust fund for, for a rental trust fund. This will be a permanent assistance program whereby those who find themselves close to being in crisis can get assistance, permanent assistance, similar to a, a real program, similar to what EDD is, how it's supposed to work. And th therefore they have that, that permanent assistance program to aid families before they become homeless. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Well, we have to just stop talking about affordable housing because we know affordable housing means housing that like people like for like people like me that work and, and can live next to their um, where they work. We need to start talking about low income housing. Listen, it's not enough low income housing here in California where people don't take too bad. We can't legislate the hearts and minds of people. We don't have enough uh, folks that take like our Section 8 vouchers. Um, one of the solutions that I have is to build faith-based housing across California because there's a lot of congregations that have tons of land. They already own the land. They want to want to build on it, but we have some zoning issues that we have to take care of in California. And I trust the faith-based community to build low-income housing because on that low-income housing, they will have those wraparound services. We are going to have to do something and maybe do some, um, um, some um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Shoot, I'm sorry, I lost my thought. But we have to think about faith-based housing. We need to um, make sure that we have low income, low, not enough low income housing across California. We gotta just stop talking about affordable people. We have to talk about the poor and we have to talk about how we're going to provide housing for people who are very, very poor and how they're gonna live here in, in California. And we can never have a pandemic again where undocumented people don't have any kind of safety net because that is also who is on the street because we didn't do anything for them and they didn't have anywhere to turn. And so a lot of them lost their homes and they end up homeless. We have to fight this homeless problem together if it, when it comes to building um, um, uh, uh, SB9 and SB10, building property in your backyard, we're gonna have to do that because this is the way we're gonna solve, solve homelessness. We gotta do it together, people. Everybody is going to have to participate in this problem, period. Thank you. Angie? Yes, thank you. Previously homeless myself with my toddlers and my family living in a car for two years uh, in the early 1988. Um, additional services and programs need to be implemented. More importantly, there needs to be um, a coordinated approach while implementing, implementing preventive measures. Uh, in the city of Hawthorne, I implemented telehealth van. It's a van that uh, two vans that provide services five days a week. They're out in the community exclusive to Hawthorne, providing outreach to homeless encampments and homeless where they could jump in the van, get on a monitor and talk to their behavior health um, providers. Uh, this is a um, growing issue as we've all seen it here in California. Uh, I'm a big pro, uh, supporter of programs and services and we need to bring it to the local level and give more funding to those that offer uh, home uh, housing and shelters to those uh, looking for it. Um, I also think uh, from my experience, I was able to get an apartment finally through, an, uh, through a payment plan, an arrangement that I made with the landlord to, to assure me uh, I have a roof over my head and I made regular payments until I made the second, uh, the, 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 the first rent, the second and the deposit. So a payment plan working collectively with those that are willing to work with those that are looking for housing. Again, uh, the things that are happening, uh, not happening currently is due to not thinking out of the box. And we're just stagnant on these tents. We're just stagnant in, in having to walk over feces and urination, and that shouldn't be the case. I'm familiar with what that looks like. I understand what that looks like, but we need to be compassionate about it and bring true resolve. And until we do that, we're gonna continuously come back here time and time again, asking what we should do about homeless. I'm the most sincere, I understand it, and I'm the one that's been working with those now currently uh, to provide services to those that need it most. And that's the homeless uh, people and family that are living in cars. Also provided uh, safe parking where folks that live in their cars can go and spend the night in a safe environment, check in at seven at night, check out at seven in the evening. But more importantly, while they're there, provide wraparound services, programs and services, and include supplies that they might need, diapers, include um, uh, sanitary uh, products they need, Give them some sense of dignity. 
not just, you know, here's a place to stay and then be gone tomorrow. We need to work with them. We need to see how we could better their lives. They're really, truly willing. However, we just need to make sure that we have caseworkers that are out there every day uh, assisting in making efforts to assure that we get them housed, we get them a job, but more importantly, that we use what we have as government officials to do that. Thank you. Thanks, and I can't remember who's up first next, but given that housing and homelessness programs are delivered locally, and a lot of the suggestions you all make are the types of uh, programs that a county or a city would institute, how can you use your position as an assembly member to better either support or push these, uh, uh, these sorts of programs forward? In other words, what is the role of the legislature that, that they are and are not doing well enough to help the localities with these sorts of ideas? I don't know who is first. Y'all are gonna have to figure it out. <laughs> okay, I, I guess I can, I guess I'll, I'll just jump in there. You know, I, I would I would say um, as a legislature, um, uh, of course, part of our job, of course, is um, to provide legislation that would, in some cases, require or incentivize the, the local um, community to provide housing programs, but also staying engaged with the local communities, um, our, our local municipalities, and holding them accountable um, for the um, outcomes. Um, not simply just checking in, but um, understanding their performance matrix and making sure that they reach those um, performance matrix in terms of um, actually building their um, building the, the units that that they're required to build. Um, also, to see uh, and to work with them because the local communities know what works for them best. So when you listen to the local communities, your local elected officials, your housing providers um, that's in the local communities, and then you take that information. Um, back and, and perhaps even um, convene, you know, a roundtable discussion so that so that we're not legislating legislating from Sacramento down, but we're Early. legislating from the from the ground um, up to Sacramento and by working with our local partners, our community um, leaders, our, our lenders and, and providers. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Yes, we're going to have to be bold going to Sacramento. So. My suggestion is, first, first of all, we probably need to do some rent control, even if I, I would propose doing rent control, even if it's a sunset, because people need to breathe. So that would be one thing that I would do, I would want to do. And then secondly, I talked about this faith-based housing. Um, we need to do some, some statewide zoning, which will make it a little bit easier for people to um, go in and build this affordable housing. And so that's what I, I think. I think that we have to be bold in Sacramento. We're going to have to uh, make moves that's not always popular, but that, that'll really help the people on the ground. And we know that rent control, which is not a popular thing to say, but we know that giving people rent control where they could take a breather, where everybody could take a breather because we're coming out of this epidemic until we could figure this out. Do I have all the solutions? No. But I know that people people on the ground are really hurting. And so they need help now. And so I think right now we need to do something bold, like take some rent control, put, uh, put a cap on it. I'm not saying rent control forever, but maybe rent control for about five years until we get over this epidemic and give people on the ground, our community people, a breather, and then try and figure it out from the state. Thank Great. you. Great. Angie. Yes, thank you. I think there needs to be uh, much greater accountability uh, I believe that um, there's a disconnect uh, in Sacramento. Not all are disconnected. However, there, are, there is a disconnect. I believe it starts in your local municipality, but more importantly, it's a collaborated, collaborated effort. Uh, there's no finger pointing, they're solution driven. And so that's important. Uh, for myself, I'm doing it here in the city of Hawthorne. I have been doing it for many years. I'm doing it in the city of Los Angeles where I've worked for 16 years working with Los Angeles, Service, uh, Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority and other organizations such as PATH and Catholic Charities and much more. I've, I've come out of pocket myself to provide uh, a hotel to families. And when I see, um, especially out late at night with families and strollers, that's important. But again, it has to be accountability. There needs to be more accountability on our elected officials. There needs to be more accountability in Sacramento. Relationships matter. I'm able to bring result because I have great relationships with a lot of these providers and services that I've done for years. One. I'll continue to do that in Sacramento. More importantly, funding. Unless you give these organizations and groups to provide the help that, that they're able to do, 
we're not going to get anywhere. Again, funding is very important. We need to think of how to pre prevent homelessness. More importantly, resolve the current issues we have today. And without that, again, we're going to be here being redundant, talking about the same matter, the same issue over and over again. I've got the experience. I've been proven to deliver 100%. Thanks. Uh, and I'll start with Tina on this one. So sometimes people don't seem to feel that that we need to build housing to stop homelessness uh, or that we only need to build certain types of housing, like only subsidized affordable housing and the rest doesn't matter. And this is often a reason that communities give for not wanting any building in their area. Do you think that we should only be building in certain places or uh, uh, is do we have enough housing for everyone? Um, and should we sort of uh, allow the idea of local control to allow communities to opt out of providing more housing. So I'm curious to know um, each of your thoughts and we'll start with Tina. It was a couple of, couple of questions there, right? And so I think that we should build housing everywhere. Again, I, I'm, I'm pushing this faith-based housing because this is our the concept that I've been working with uh, Senator Weiner on for the last couple of years. We should, we should build housing everywhere. Um, we, we have too many people on the streets, guys, um, but we got to make sure it's it's low income and affordable. We can't just build housing and build housing and people can't afford it. That's not going to work. But I do think we should build housing everywhere. I think we should build. If you have land in, in, on your property, if you want to build some housing, let's build some. Again, we have to do this together. And I don't think local communities can and can, should be able to opt out building affordable housing and low income housing. Everybody's gonna have to put in on this. Everybody's going to have to be responsible for, for the housing problem. So no, I don't think that uh, uh, local folk, local municipalities should be able to opt out. I think we should build housing everywhere, but I think it should be affordable or low income um, housing that we have enough One. housing. We don't need to build any more of that. We need to make sure that the, what we're concentrating on from, from the state it, is building housing for our people where they can live and sustain. Thank you. Angie? Uh, yes, thank you. Again, I support all housing. Um, I would be creating affordable housing while respecting the character of our neighborhoods. More importantly, um, uh, California is expensive. There's a lot of folks that are moving. They're leaving. And unless we take hold of what that looks like, we're not going to be able to, uh, again, provide incentives and, and rebates and everything else to our communities. Uh, it's important to understand uh, we need to be able to come with uh, come up with some better solutions on prevention of homelessness. And yes, there's families that want to be first time home buyers, but can't even afford the down payment to do that. Right. So we need to just work again with these uh, great organizations and group that finance that provide financial literacy, that provide banking skills, more importantly, how to keep good credit. All of that is important. How to work to home ownership. But again, if you live in an apartment, that's fine too. I've never owned a home. I live in an apartment. That's what I could afford today. One bit. And I believe too that, um, uh, uh, again, a collaborated effort, uh, providing, again, assistance to those that want to purchase a home. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. Yes, we need more housing. If it includes building a house behind your house, I don't see a problem with that, especially when you want to bring mom to move into to your house that you just built for them in, in the back of your home. So housing's important. And I know folks don't like density, but we have to go up here in our city. We're only 5.6. We need higher density here. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So when it comes to um, building in other communities, I believe that every community has to have their fair share of housing. You see communities such as um, Lawndale and even uh, Hawthorne, we're doing our fair share of housing. But there's other communities that's more affluent communities that have more open space than these cities, but they're not doing their fair share of housing. As the member of the legislature, I have to hold those communities accountable to do their fair share. They don't want the density that we have in Lawndale, Hawthorne, and other communities, Inglewood. Um, but we as it's our job to make sure that we provide housing because this is a housing crisis and this is all hands on deck. So we have to make sure that our local communities, all of our cities, whether you're a fluent community or not, you have to do your share to provide housing. The local communities cannot decide to, to opt out and we cannot uh, allow them to opt out of, of this responsibility. Land use, yes, it's a function of the local One. Um, government, but remember, we as state legislature, we also control the land use, have to make sure that they do their fair share. 
home ownership is key. I agree that we have to have more education for home ownership and you know, home ownership opportunities so people can under, understand um, how to be a homeowner and how to have um, um, programs that will assist them in their down payment assistance and that will educate them in a way that they can stay in their home, home so they won't become in crisis in, in, in danger of foreclosures. But Birdie. at the end of the day, we have to provide for more housing. Every community has to do their part. Great, thanks. And so we're going to switch gears a little, go to Angie. And I'm curious, uh, you know, California, people often complain, is a very high tax burden state. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, the gas tax and suspending the gas tax, uh, even though it's only three to four cents a gallon. Uh, but people, you know, given the high price of gas, uh, talking about maybe we should be doing that. There's been talk for years about reforming Prop 13. Um, talk about giving more money or less money to corporations, depending on your position. I'm wondering what you think about our current tax uh, scheme in California, and if you were going to reform it, what you would do. Well, taxation here in the state of California, and even in our city, we're sick and tired of being taxed. Uh, that that includes, you know, uh, high cost of uh, groceries. You know, right now that's what we're we're seeing, and including uh, gas. I understand that they're looking to, you know, bring some some gas to us from the reserves that we have. Yeah, but at whose cost, right? Here we are again. There's always propositions and ballots that are being placed that, you know, we have to tax uh, your, your, your residents. We have to tax, you know, uh, this and that. Um, it's, 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 it's overkill. I think there needs to be some other reforms that we could take. Uh, what those look like, we would have to collectively work on that. I don't have the answer for everything. But I know that um, I wouldn't support, say, for instance, a gas tax. Uh, I don't even know if rebates is something we really want to take a look at. I mean, we're, we're right now uh, trying to figure out just how to live, um, especially for those that are uh, without One jobs minute. right now due to COVID and others that had to leave their jobs because uh, of, of, of not being vaccinated. So there's a whole number of issue. Uh, Prop 13. Um, you know, experiencing the cost, at, like I said, at the pump, and uh, more more likely people that I've spoken to, you know, this includes being um, taxed for services and dining. So uh, what is it that we can do? Um, I, I would have to research that again and, and, and provide a better answer to you, but that we're done with taxes. We need more and better. Thank you, Robert. So let me start off by saying that, oh, thank you for that. Let me start off by saying that um, I do not support any um, change to um, Prop 13. So that's that's a, a non-starter uh, for me. But for the gas tax, I believe you was asking whether or not we should suspend on um, the gas tax, even though it only makes up um, 3%. I believe when people understand, yeah, we, we all feel that at, at, at the pump. I'm driving, driving less um, by necessity and everyone else as well. But we have to remember what the gas tax is for. The gas tax, the local community use the, the gas tax for infrastructure projects. That's your road improvements. That's your streets and gutters um, so that we can uh, make sure that we adhere to, to all of the environmental standards um, that's, been, that's been placed um, in the state of California, which is why we're one of the, the leaders um, in cleaning up our environment. But when you suspend the gas tax, then that's less money for the the local communities to use those gas, the gas tax and those funding for those infrastructure infrastructure uh, um, um, projects. So I wouldn't support, although it, it hurts me to just like everyone else to um, to fill up. This is a temporary thing that hope we, we'll get through uh, once the um, the um, this unjust war um, is, is over. But I would not su support um, suspending the gas tax. Thank, Thank you. you. Tina? Um, I wouldn't suspend the gas tax either because again we're. During the pandemic right now, we just need to put a freeze on raising taxes, lowering taxes, rent relief. Like we, I mean, uh, uh, rent, we need rent control. Like right now we need to just take a breather on everything so that we could catch up. But I would say that I would work, first thing I would do is work on reform in Proposition 13 because I supported schools and communities first. We do need that money to come back to the community and we do not want corporations like Disneyland to keep pay paying the same taxes that they paid in the 60s. We have to reform this. This is hurting our children. We need money for schools. This also brings down crime, by the way, people. We need money for schools, for parks, for libraries, for, for um, senior centers. We need uh, uh, for after school programs to subsidize businesses so that 
uh, poor kids can go work in, on summer programs. We do need to reform Proposition 13 really badly. That's the first thing I would want to work on when we talk about our tax system is to reform that proposition. One. It's really hurting us. And I would say about the rebates, we need an inflation rebate for the poor because this skyrocketing gas is going to really hurt our, our moms who are out there that's going to have to choose between gas and um, gas and food. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Robert this time, switching gears again. Okay. So with uh, global warming and uh, what we thought was a drought, we are realizing now is a, the new normal which looks like it's always going to get only going to get worse. Uh, hydrology is changing. The snowpack is melting, changing where our water comes from. Um, given the pressures that that this new normal of climate is creating, the stress on agriculture, on our urban centers, what would you do about water in California? Oh, that's a good one. What would we do about water in California? Well, we definitely want to make sure that we hold those folks accountable that misuse the water system. In, in other words, those who, who, who use more than their allocation of, of water, we have to safeguard our allocation of water, whether it's the state water project or, or what have you um, in, in California. And we have to be very strong on our, um, on our um, efforts to make sure that the um, local governments um, enforce um, the um, water um, conservation um, um, laws and, and ordinances. And so that we're not um, wasting, wasting our waters and we have to make sure that, of course, we, we hold those polluters as well um, responsible, um, whether it's through the Regional Water Quality Control Boards um, or the other um, environmental um, um, agencies, that they hold these um, boards accountable, these polluters um, accountable, so that we have clean water, uh, water standards. So then we can use the, um, these waters, of course, um, for um, potable uh, consumption as well as agriculture. Um, uh, One. Use. We have to be very well regulated. And as you know, you know, the, the war is still going on for water versus the North versus the South. Um, that has never um, ceased, but we have to work um, collectively um, and collaboratively um, in the North as well as in the South to make sure that our water needs are met. Thank you, Tina. We have to start conserving water more. And one idea I have is for, I know we love beautiful green grass here in Southern California, but I lived in Northern California for a while. Their grass don't, doesn't look like our grass. It's not all green. And they actually have brown grass up in NorCal, you guys, because they're really, uh, they really concentrate on conserving water. We could think about taking our, our, our yards and turning them and putting the beautiful rocks and things in them. And that's a way, because watering grass every day, you guys, that takes up a lot of water. And so that's one way as, as citizens Together, we could start to conserve conserve water in the state of California, especially in Southern California. We got to start think, stop thinking about these green lines in our front and backyards, and start to like either letting that go or changing, uh, changing up our yard so that we won't use so much water. Because conserving water is is one way that we can ta tackle um, water shortage. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. This is a statewide uh, conservation um, issue. More importantly, we need to make sure to be able to test and assure we have clean drinking water. Um, the desert communities out, say for instance, in Huron and over in, um, um, what is it? The, green, the Greenfield area where all of our uh, hard workers are working on the, in the fields, uh, picking our fruits and vegetables who have deserts out there. We need to find more uh, water, um, efforts in those areas, but more importantly, we need to reserve water. It's, it's, it's all related to, again, the, the, the history that we have here in California. Uh, you know, it never rains in California. That's what they say, right? We need to start being able to capture that water and we need to be able to find more water wells. And, and, and just like we built in Africa and all these other countries, uh, water resources One. that we need to bring to a local level too, because the issue is real. Water is important to us and we need to be able to sustain that for longevity. And uh, more importantly, um, conserving water as, as a good uh, um, member of the community and assuring that there's uh, folks not wasting water. However, it's, it's reclaim and it's also uh, conservation that we need to work on a little bit more and more aggressively. Thanks. All right, Tina, we're starting with you this time. California high-speed rail, 
crucial transportation project or a symptom of poor planning and wasteful government spending? Uh, given that the budget is now over $100 billion with no funding plan in place, and they are still trying to work on a, the, the section of track between Merced and Bakersfield, what would you do about this project? What's the next step? Well, we can't discontinue it because we spent too much money now. I mean, we can't waste the taxpayers' money. I think that, you know, I, we should continue to try to build it, but in, in a better a better financial way. Um, we do need we do need the high speed speed rail, I believe, uh, to get from one side of the uh, state to another, uh, and hopefully it's electric as well. Let's make sure that it's electric and we're not using so much gas. But I wouldn't I wouldn't trash the the project because we've already spent money and we cannot waste our taxpayer money. We do need to complete this, but let's we need to do it in a more financial, better financial way than what we've done. Angie, well. Uh, I served on the service uh, on the Metro Service Council and you know I was charged along with the seven board members to assure that we have not only a, a good experience and I'm talking right now buses and I understand it's not rail, but I'm going there. Uh, we just need to make sure again that um, we're providing uh, a glimpse of how this could benefit the people of California. Uh, this is uh, through job creation and efforts to um, again, make it more, much easier for, for a travel and experience to and from. Uh, I also assisted with um, Elon Musk with his boring company underground, the first uh, tunneling, which is uh, a vehicle that's underground and can go roughly 30 to 35 miles an hour underground to get you to where you need to be. That's something in the future uh, that I think we should be looking at. And uh, I think more importantly, um, you know, the cost of this high-speed rail was um, tremendous, tremendous. Uh, however, uh, innovative ways to help us travel to and from is something we we should be really uh, doing and um, working along those that are the brains behind it and uh, reach out to those that uh, uh, are the inventors of other innovative ways to bring uh, speed rail. Um, I, 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 I know that we had passed this and it's it's something that's current in the, in the pipeline. It's too long in the waiting. Okay, Robert. Okay, so mine's gonna be real quick. Yes, I am supportive of the high speed rail project and you're absolutely right. Poor planning implementation, that needs to be overhauled and revamped so we can hold um, the agencies um, in charge um, accountable so that they can deliver um, um, what they promised and, and what we um, allow them to do, um, the, the citizens of, of, of the state of California. But the high speed rail is much needed. I mean, you're talking about a project that should have been um, something that we had um, 20, 30 years ago. So I'm in support of the high speed rail, not only because it's a needed transportation uh, um, project, but also because it will provide for, for great uh, union jobs and livable wages. And so that's always something that, that I'll make sure that projects um, in my district and, and also throughout the state um, have um, project labor agreements and that they are be strong um, union jobs. Um, also, I had the opportunity to serve also on the Metro um, um, South Bay um, Service um, um, Council where we looked at um, One. issues. And so this speaks to, um, to that issue, getting folks from one part of the, the state to the next um, part of the state to the other part of the state um, fast, um, it helps reduce, you know, of course, um, the uh, emissions from fossil fuel and, of course, pollution. And so I'm all in favor of the project, but we just got to make them accountable and make sure that we stay on task. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with Angie on this one. Um, in a lot of cities, um, the majority of the population, regardless of income, uses public transportation and uses transit. And that's true in all the great cities of the world, whether it's Paris, New York, even in San Francisco. Whereas in Los Angeles, the people who ride transit tend to be our poorest residents with no other options. So how would you improve our transit system in Los Angeles? What do you do about the people who don't wanna take away a lane of, traf of, of traffic because uh, uh, for the benefit of bus rapid transit? Uh, how do you make transit work when you have uh, a lot of suburban neighborhoods? And how would you, or is the solution really just to give everyone an electric car and, and just assume that everyone's gonna keep driving everywhere? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't afford an electric car. And I know lots of families that, uh, brown and black families that can't afford electric cars, let alone bikes, right? 
So, you know, we rely on public transportation. I've been instrumental in providing um, bike paths here in, in, in our city. Uh, it did take away some lanes, but at the end of the day, it's providing for those that uh, are innovative and want to use other means of transportation, which is important. Um, again, we need to be able to see how we could work with Metro and other service agencies that provide uh, public transportation to those that uh, are looking for it. We need more stops, bus stops. We need more routes so that folks can easily come off and on. We need safety in around public transportation. We need to be able to provide shelters and seating where you want to wait for a bus, not have to sit there with a stroller, six kids in the rain waiting for a bus. All of this is important and I'm glad the question is posed because it's those that can't afford a whole lot. And that's from housing to food, groceries, gas, uh, you know, people are stealing gas right now. Get, get, I, mean, I mean, that's just amazing. But, you know, at $6 a gallon, you know, people are choosing to walk and or double up, have uh, family members uh, share rides and share riding uh, wherever possible. However, we need a, a better, a better, a better skilled um, workforce, more importantly, so that folks can get to work can get to provide and get what they need through through transportation. Thank you. So for me, um, I'm sorry. I'm just. Saying. I said I think Robert's next. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I definitely believe we need to improve our, our public on transit um, system. We need to provide for, and this is one of the things we've always discussed um, on the uh, the Metro um, Governance Council that I had the opportunity to serve on for six years. We need to, of course, um, provide for, for more um, buses in our communities, more flexible um, buses in terms of the routes, and the routes need to change um, upon the demand. We also need to focus on having more um, um, bike um, path. I do appreciate the bike path um, in, in Hawthorne. Londale is still looking at our bike paths. I, I do that bike path all the time in, um, in Hawthorne. But most importantly, we also need to concentrate on getting discretionary um, riders um, on the bus. Um, a lot of times there's a disincentive for those who can afford um, to, to drive, um, but they would use the bus if the bus was more convenient or light rail more convenient. And in, in the case of the bus, the bus was more uh, uh, cleaner in some cases. And, and, and quite frankly, sometimes there are some security concerns on some bus stops, you know, whether it's lighting. One. You have, um, uh, some people may not want to take the bus because they may have security concerns on some of the bus routes or what have you that needs to be addressed. Um, so we need to make sure that our buses are um, um, cleaners. And we also need to look at that last mile. The last mile is sometimes get the discretionary um, rider, um, uh, how they're going to um, get to um, that last mile um, from, say, for instance, if you're going downtown. Um, or to, to, to work. How are you going to get from that last mile to your to your work or to your final designation? So we need more bike routes, electric um, bikes would be an option, and other uh, modes of transportation on that last, last mile. And, and as a legislature, we need to provide um, funding to the local uh, communities, uh, metropolitan planning organizations, um, to provide funding for that last mile, whether it's um, allowing people to, um, to rent um, electric bikes or to to buy electric bikes that um, that you can park and what have you um, in a safe manner, but that would be some of the solutions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Yes, when I worked for Los Angeles County Office of Education, I used to take the metro and I'd park right over here in in, in um, Manhattan Beach and take the metro right on over to um, Laco. And I would say that they gave me they gave me a rebate. They gave me like I got like sixty dollars a month for taking the metro. I think that if if we want to get like working class people to take the to start to take the metro, we need to take a couple of years to work with the government entities first to maybe give the give back a rebate to the staff employees for taking for taking metro and then work with uh, small businesses. Give them a rebate to offer their employee a pass every month and maybe a $50, because $50 coming back into somebody's family is a lot of money these days. So you, 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 we work with company, local companies to get employers, employees to take the metro. I used to take it every day. It was awesome. And then maybe we even need to do a new advertising plan to let, let you know, like working moms who take the metro, you have a chance to read your book on the way One. home and all those things, because it was really good for me when I took it, when I used to take it. So I think it would be partnering with government agencies and partnering with small businesses to offer their employees a little stipend for taking the Metro. Thank you. 
Uh, we're going to start this time with Robert. Um, Cal the California Environmental Protection uh, Qual Quality Act, CEQA, has been a longstanding way that we evaluate projects in California to make sure that they don't do environmental harm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. also a lot of housing builder builders have found CEQA mm -hmm. to be a barrier to building housing. Uh, a lot of other developments have been stopped yeah. over sometimes not maybe real legitimate environmental concerns. Do you believe that CEQA needs reforming? Mute so yourself, Cara. You oh, Cara, you, you need to mute. Thank you. So yeah, CEQA, re reform. Perfect as it is, or would you reform it? And if so, how? We'll start with, with uh, well, Robert. Well, let me say, first of all, CEQA is definitely um, the tool that we need um, to stay in place to make sure that the environmental um, considerations um, are met so that we can safeguard our, our communities in terms of the environmental effects. I understand CEQA has some other components as well, but one of the, the, um, the most crucial elements of CEQA, of course, the environmental uh, controls. We need to streamline the CEQA process and we need to make sure that people are not utilizing um, CEQA um, as, a, as a way to kill a project. So if, if there's challenges to CEQA, those issues need to be heard and adjudicated in a timely manner, and we must make sure that happens. But at the same time, we can't not allow people to use CEQA as a pediment to building housing. Um, we, we've seen that over and over where, 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 where people that don't have legitimate concerns, they just, just launch a CEQA, um, uh, a CEQA uh, objection in, in court or what have you through the local communities. And oftentimes that dissuade um, builders from, from building um, the housing because even if they were to prevail on the CEQA challenge, One. It would take, sometimes it takes them months and sometimes even years. And so that's a dissuasive um, tactics that is used um, by some to dissuade um, housing from being built. So we wanna, we wanna reform that end of, of CEQA to make sure it's not weaponized, but we definitely wanna keep CEQA in place in terms of safeguarding um, our community um, concerning environmental impacts. Thank you. Myself? Sorry, Tina's next. <laughs> yes, I would not reform um, CEQA. We need to keep CEQA, but I do, I do also believe that we need one statewide CEQA policy that's statewide that everybody has to um, to to abide by. Because we know that it, we do need our environmental impacts. We don't want people building without having having our environmental impacts. And so, I but I do believe that we shouldn't be going city by city, municipality by municipality. We need one blanket, just like with zoning. I believe with zoning, some of the zoning too. We need one blanket zoning, and we need some blanket CEQA uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, as much as uh, it is important, uh, accountability matters too. Just like uh, regulations for underground uh, piping, uh, I'll use Chevron for instance, or the railroad company that sends out notices for public hearings and things like this, community outreach. CEQA needs to do a better job to send out notices when it has hearings or it has uh, certain items before them uh, for consideration. But more importantly, it has to be uh, uh, given to those communities where CEQA hearings are being held. I know there's a lot of hearings that are held in Los Angeles. Maybe some of those hearings need to be held locally in communities where it's more accessible. I think there still needs to be um, some changes that could be made to it, uh, not to saying to take away from it, but making some enhancements to assure that the greater public uh, of California has more input. Um, I've made sure in uh, public hearings here that require public hearings, if I'm not satisfied with the hearing, I make them go back out and go door to door One. and assure that the community is aware of what's happening in our city. Transparency is very important too. Uh, CEQA needs to be more transparent when it comes to deadlines, when it comes to notifications and local papers uh, and being provided those uh, dates and times with accuracy and more importantly, engagement. CEQA needs to be more engaged in the community. It can't just be an agency that sets these hearings and they're not in the, in the community, giving some sense of education to those that don't understand what CEQA is. 30. So all of that's important. Thanks. Uh, Tina, you're going to start with this one. Given the current uh, crisis with gasoline or the uh, increase in the price of gasoline, some of my colleagues have been asking that we increase oil production in California for in energy independence. Is that an approach that you would support? And basically, what do you think we should do about oil in California? 
um, right now, I think we, again, we're in a crisis, guys. So I, I think we should just not make these changes right now. Because number one, when you think about, when you think about oil, and you think about it going up to eight, maybe $10 a gallon, this is gonna be a problem, especially for the poorer part of our community. Listen, people cannot choose between taking their kids to school, going to work and feeding them and putting, uh, putting clothes on their backs. Right now, because of the war and because of what we're going through with the war and gas prices, right now we just, we can't halt anything. We need to just, we, we just have to stop and stay where we are on everything, guys. People have to catch a breath. Not only did we have the uh, epidemic, which caused homelessness, which caused people to get poor, but now we're having a gas uh, gas crisis, which is going to cause even more um, problems. And we know that having high gas causes food to go up. We can't pay for bread, milk, uh, uh, all kinds of supplies to get even more expensive. So I would say, you know, I am an environmentalist. Um, I would say we can't stop doing anything right now because it's just going to cause a problem. So we can't shut down drilling when the prices are going up we just need to take a breath let's let's let this pass and then we come back and we start we start solving working on those problems thank you okay thanks angie uh local resources are very important um foreign gas foreign trade uh everything that is made outside of our country outside of the u.s we need to think more uh innovative here in uh california uh i understand the importance of keeping jobs I understand some of those job includes some of those that are not favored, such as gas, oil, and other products such as those. Um, however, we need to be able to keep our families, um, you know, fed, and that's important. Um, I also believe that um, we think of other ways of producing here uh, in California. I understand that there's some oil um, wells that have not been, uh, say, for instance. Um, there's permits that are in California that have uh, these oil companies that have permits to drill. However, uh, currently California wants to try and buy those permits back. Um, we need to take a look at that. More importantly, I'm, I, I, I understand a lot well, of families and groups are not for say, for instance, for fracking. That's another sensitive issue. Uh, and I understand that some of those have been shut down. And um, my, my, my whole pro, uh, idea with regards to what's currently happening is due to the fact that we shortchanged ourselves. We're not become uh, innovative and more productive here in our state, relying too much on other countries for uh, commodities. And that's something that we needed to be do better on, but it's a collaborated efforts working with those that are not so popular. Thank you, Robert. First of all, I would, I, I would say that we, we definitely can't continue to, to rely on um, foreign um, actors as much as we are relying on them. My question would be, um, will um, increase in the production of um, uh, uh, petroleum in, in California, will that uh, reduce um, the price at the pump? If the answer is, is yes, I think that would be a way of providing relief for our struggling families um, that are struggling um, even before this, the gasoline uh, um, crisis. But we have to also make sure that we keep in mind that, that these are good union jobs that our families depend on. And we have to make sure that we keep California working. There, there are a number of, of drill permits that's waiting um, to be, be signed. We need to take a look at those, see which ones are uh, um, worthy of, of signing. And even if it's temporary or whatever to get past this hump, we have to make sure that at the end of the day, we have to keep California working. I think we can do that without having an adverse effect on, you know, on the environment. And at the same time, keep um, our union um, workers working, our families um, working um, in, in these jobs. But we have to make sure that we don't continue to be held hostage from other, from foreign, uh, foreign companies and, and, and foreigners. So if that means we have to, um, for a short period of time, increase the production of, of petroleum um, in, in California, um, without having an adverse effect on the market. In this case, hopefully it will, will um, decrease the price of the pump. I think that will provide some relief for, for our families, for our, our working um, uh, folks here in California. So thank you. Thanks, so I'm starting with Angie. The Balboa wetlands is a very big concern in the, in the 62nd AD. And I'm wondering what your vision is for it and uh, how you would move it forward. 
Oh, and, it, and, excuse me. It's it's Biona. Biona, <laughs> sorry. We yeah. say Yona here. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank, thank you, Kara. Uh, in the city of Los Angeles, where I started working early in uh, 2001, there was a creation of uh, the Balboa, uh, similar to the Balboa wetlands in Los Angeles, in South Los Angeles, something that was never done ever in its history. And um, it's, it's a beautiful setting. It's uh, walk paths and it has uh, recreation and parks and whatnot. Um, I think we need to look at that. I think there should be uh, some obviously uh, uh, financing that needs to be contributed to assure that it continues in a, in a safe uh, and, and, and prosperous way for future. And uh, I think it's important that we try and preserve as much as we can, uh, such as the, the wetlands. And um, I think it would be an opportunity for uh, it to ultimately benefit through the environment and giving back to community. So I would definitely take a look at that more and see how we could, uh, you know, provide funding to keep that um, effort going. Okay, Robert. Um, can you give me the question again? I'm sorry. The question is the wetlands, what you would, what's your vision for it? Because there's uh, some, you know, differences of opinion in the community and how would you do it? Well, I, I would say uh, I had the opportunity to, to work on um, this issue and to be a part of um, several um, brainstorming um, uh, uh, meetings um, as the district director for Assemblywoman Auden Burke. When you're talking about the Biona um, wetlands, what I'll tell you what I don't support is the bulldozing, the wholesale bulldozing um, of this project. Um, the wetlands um, is an ecological um, reserve and it should stay as such. And we also should have the sensitive um, public access. Right now, there's a push to have um, public access. This land was set aside, or was developed, I should say, as a wetland and preserve as such so that we can have public access. We have to continue to, to make sure that this wetland is open, continue to be open for the public. And instead of this amusement um, style type where you have too many um, people in the wetlands destroying the habitats and, um, and the, the, the rare species um, in the wetlands, we have to preserve that. But we have to also provide funding in, um, in the state of California. We can do that perhaps through the budget um, process to make sure- um, One project is not adversely affecting um, the wetlands, the habitants of the wetlands. So I do not support bulldozing um, of the wetlands, but we must continue to have it open to the, to the public so that we can enjoy the beautiful um, um, nature there, the, the wildlife there, as well as all of the, the unique um, um, flowers and vegetation um, there in the wetlands. Thank you. Tina. On this one, I agree with you 100%, Robert. Um, I had an, I've been working on the wetlands as well when, when I was the district director for then assembly member Steve Bradford. Um, we want to preserve the wetlands. It's beautiful. We don't want any bulldozing on it. We want our children to be able to tour on it and get to, to learn about nature. We need our, our walk paths, our bike lanes. Um, I work with Mar I used to work with Marsha Hanscom about this when I was um, the district director uh, for assembly member Bradford and the wetlands is a place that that where our kids and our community should be able to enjoy it. We do not want it destroyed. We want it cleaned up from what I understand. I haven't been it, been there for a while, but from what I understand, it's a lot of stuff going on. I even think we have some homeless issues over there. We want to get that resolved and we want to make sure that it is open to the public and is used by our children and families and that it's something that we preserve in our community. Sometime in, in the state of California, especially in Southern California, we get rid of our, our historic. One. We want to make sure that we don't do this with the wetland, that we keep and we preserve the wetland. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask Kara where we are with time because I'm not sure how long I should keep going, whether I should have them sum up now or keep asking questions. Well, it's it's really been really wonderful. Thank you, Laura. I think it's time to sum up. I think uh, ballots are going out in now. The ballots will be going out, everyone, all you people. And there are quite a, mostly, I uh, did want to say people on today are mostly members, voting members, which is wonderful. Uh, ballots are going out and you will have until 1.15 on the, to ballots because we have another uh, assembly district to vote on and then we have the LAUSD candidates. So you might wanna hold on to them until maybe 1.10. Just wanted to say that. And now I think it's time for your closing remarks. So I think that, who did we have beginning the opening? Was it Angie 
when we yeah. did that. So why don't we do Tina, Angie, Robert? We'll do it in that order. So Tina, you're up first. Tina, Angie. Uh, Democratic Democrats, listen, this is an opportunity here in District 62 and, and 61 to flip this seat from a my Democrat to a progressive Democrat. Look, I know you guys are tired of sending people to Sacramento and learn that they do not align with our values. I will be a progressive vote. I know the challenge of a, of a progressive in Sacramento. I'm the only candidate that has, uh, has served in Sacramento as a chief of staff. And so I know what they're up against. I'm also the only candidate that's worked on um, electing uh, other Democrats. I worked on a million dollar campaign to elect Supervisor Holly Mitchell, one of the most progressive office holders in the state. I will not only go to Sacramento and vote on progressive is issues, but I will partner with all of you to elect progressives across the state. Look, Democrats, let's make sure we're electing 100 percent Democrats. I am endorsed by SEIU California, Equality California, Courage Campaign, California Legislative Black Caucus, California Legislative Progressive Caucus, Supervisor Holly Mitchell, Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Senator Scott Weiner, Betsy Butler. My name is Tina McKenna, and I'm a progressive, and I'm running for the AD6261 Assembly District, and I am asking for your support. Thank you. Thank you. As a mother, grandmother, former PTA, president, elected city clerk, city council, former staffer to Councilman Curran Price in the city of Los Angeles, 16 years, former staff in the State Assembly, State Senate, nine years. I have the experience and the know-how. More importantly, how to resolve homeless with a coordinated approach while implementing preventive measures, prioritizing public safety with lesser crimes like porch pirates to property crimes to violent crimes. Uh, create affordable housing while respecting the char character of our neighborhoods, creating affordable housing with respect to our uh, neighborhoods, returning our schools, local businesses, and communities to post-pandemic normal, strengthening our economy by supporting job creation, infrastructure, investments, quality education, and training for all. Listening to you is how I will effectively present you. My greatest honor would be to serve you in the state legislature. Join me in helping me bring change to the 61st, 62nd district that is desperately needed. I am not taking any corporate money. I'm endorsed by former State Assembly member, uh, for, former State Assembly member Richard Alatori, Councilman Curran Price, Hugo Rojas, Santa Valley Union School Board member, Maricel Cruz, former member Lenox Elementary School. I also have endorsement from the City of Huron, the City of Monterey Park, the City of Oxnard, the City of Beverly Hills, the City of Santa Ana, the City of Santa uh, Rosemead, uh, Greenfield, Bellflower and lots of community-based and church-based communities. Most importantly, I'm supported by the people like you. And again, it's not just rhetoric, it's information that you could look me up on any uh, Google and see that I have been doing the work. I am the one that understands casework. I know how to navigate government. More importantly, I'm sincere to the seat that I hold. This opportunity came up because your member resigned. And because your member resigned, the people are not being represented. And I've spoken to the people and they're tired. They want someone that's going to bring them change. And I'm the person to do that. Stop. As the only Latina, I am honored to have served in those capacities. Thank you so much. Robert. Again, thank you, Democrats, for allowing me the, this opportunity. I'm running for the state assembly to make sure that the promise for a better future is accessible to our children and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I have had the honor of working for four progressive members of the Democratic Party. I am 100%, 200% Democrat. My record speaks for itself of my Democratic values. I look forward to representing Democrats in the state assembly. If elected, I will bring over 24 years of legislative experience working to move our families um, forward, including homeless crisis, solving that, the restorative justice for our kids, fighting for good paying jobs and protecting the progress that we made for the LGBT rights community and also protecting our public land and our environment. I'm on track for winning this election, not only because I have done the work, but because I have the important, important um, people behind me. You're talking about the California Democratic Party. These are your local One. delegates. 
has endorsed my campaign. I am the only candidate in, endorsed by the California Democratic Party. UA Local 250, ask me Local 1895, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Ted Lou, Senator Ben Allen, Assemblywoman Autumn Burke, Janice Hahn, and over 20 elected officials that's on the ground. They know what we need in Sacramento. They know my work of 24 years of working with the legislature. I look forward to to working with the 30 West DM clubs in Sacramento. I ask for your vote. I ask for your support. I'm Robert Pulling Miles, and as always, I'm pulling for you. Well, I guess I want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time and mostly for running. Um, it is difficult. It is time consuming. It's emotionally draining, but it's so, so important. And we are all very grateful to you. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kara. Thanks again, everybody, for having me. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much. And by the way, I just wrote something in the chat, you know, no nasties, everybody. Nastiness in the chat will get you kicked right out of this meeting. And I'm not kidding. And because Michelle Martin is tough, right, Michelle? Yeah. Oh, heck yes. <laughs> oh, heck yes, right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful. Um, Really good questions, Laura, and, and others who submitted these questions to us. We sort of um, put them all together and came up with, uh, I think, a pretty good package. I think we all have an idea of what, um, what you're thinking, you candidates, how, you're, how you will be in Sacramento. That's what we're really interested in, who we want to represent us. This is our district here. Um, okay, so everyone, I said before that the ballots have gone out and I hope you all have them. If you don't receive them, just let me know and I'll go and check on, uh, while the next thing is happening. So um, <clears throat> now, um, let me see. Um, we're going to have the AD51 candidates next and that is Louis Abramson, and I think Louis Abramson was on as Cara Robin. I do believe. I hope you've changed your name. I have. I have. I'm sorry. I don't know how that happened. I'm. But That's I'm fine. Here. That's fine. I. Okay. I, I always need a clone, actually, to tell you the truth. There's a lot going on in my life, and uh, Rick Chavez Zver is also the other candidate we have, uh, as we did with the um, AD 62, soon to be 61. The can you candidates will have two minutes opening two minutes to answer the questions. You don't have to take the full two minutes, um, but, you, but you will have that because some of them need a little more explanation. And then a two minutes closing. Um, hopefully we will have your portion go for a half an hour. You will be moderated by our dear board member um, and member at large, Julie Goodman, a writer and editor. Where are you, Julie? I'm right here brilliant woman here. So she will be asking you the questions. And again, Mark Salzberg will be your timer. He will give you a one minute warning and then uh, 30 seconds. So uh, Julie, on you. Thank you, Cara. Thank you for, and um, I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity. I'm a grateful longtime resident of the 51st district and so i'm excited to be able to talk to both oh, of oh, you. I, i'm so sorry i'm so sorry to interrupt you i i do want to <laughs> acknowledge cheryl turner who is on the call as as people came in i forgot to do that um and cheryl is running for karen bass's seat for congress <laughs> in 37 and i also want to acknowledge <laughs> Uh, Rick Tuttle, who is our former city controller. I see Rick is on the call as well. So that's Cute. it. Sorry, Julie, back at you. Um, Tara, quick question. How are the ballots going out via email? The ballots are going out via email. Okay. And you should, they, they went out at about 1235. So they should be there. And as I said, hold on to them, you know, unless you're not going to wait, unless you're only in the 60 second and only interested in voting for that, which I don't know why, because these people, whoever they are, whatever district are representing us and they're a vote, you know, and they're a vote and they're people we can lobby because they're our neighbors and are call up and say, wait a minute, why did you vote on this? We do not agree. We're, we're very uh, vicious here at our club, you guys, you know, we're on it. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, hold on to your ballots if you can until uh, possibly 110 and then just make, you know, vote and send it in. 
and the balloting closes at 115. Okay, just to okay. let you know, I didn't get one. Oh, okay. I'll see. Okay, if I so let's get started. Um, <laughs> welcome. And I, I guess let's start um, since we run the gamut from A to Z here, why don't we start with Lewis Abramson? Um, I'm going to ask both of you, what are your top priorities in this race and why? I guess this is your opening statement, really. Fantastic. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Louis Abramson. I'll tell you right now, my top priorities are housing and homelessness. I think those intersect very deeply with issues of climate change and mental health reform. These are my priorities because I live in Hollywood, which is uh, very dramatically impacted by the homelessness crisis, which we're all familiar with. One in 30 of my neighbors lives on the street. That's three times above the LA city average. Uh, and um, I, I've been working as an organizer and a community leader here, uh, reaching out to those folks. I've helped mothers with three month old babies get off the street. I've been the first to find seniors who've had their jaw broken for over two weeks, but couldn't get any medical attention because no one was out there looking for them. They had to hold up a sign to flag me down to uh, make sure someone saw them. Uh, I've helped, I was the first to call when the pandemic broke out, seniors living in their car with AIDS during, of course, a pandemic that was affecting immunocompromised people. And most recently, I helped an honorably discharged U.S. Navy veteran who happens to be a Black trans woman uh, get off the street. And I don't believe any of these stories has a place in our California, but they're true. More are becoming true every day. And I worry that unless we change who we're sending to Sacramento, we're not going to get ahead of these things. One, I am a scientist. I'll be the only scientist in the state assembly, the only professional scientist if I'm elected. I'm a renter. Right now, there are two renters in all of the state legislature. I'd be the third. And I'm also an organizer. I've had my boots on the ground on the problems we all know are toughest um, for the past few years. So I think when the status quo is this broken, different is what we need in, in the state capitol. I think I'm different from a lot of the folks who we send up there. And I hope uh, that I can earn your support for my vision. 30. Hey. Thank you, Rick. You're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Hello, West LA Democrats. Thank you for allowing me to join you today. I'm Rick chavez -Zaber. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and I'm here today because to ask for your support uh, in my candidacy to re represent the 51st district. And I believe I'm the best candidate because uh, my I have a record of uh, progressive leadership for over two decades. Um, and I think that I'm best equipped to advance the progressive values that we share as Democrats. Uh, a vision for California where um, every person can support their family on a single paycheck, where people have good retirement security and we achieve pay parity. A California where every person has a home and where, abundant, uh, where affordable housing is abundant. A California where women uh, have reproductive care and, have a, and the right to abortion is preserved a California where every person is respected no matter their race, their ethnicity, their gender, gender identity, or faith. A California where our public education One. is funded at the top of the country rather than at the bottom of the country. Um, and finally, a California where we actually have a social safety net for our vulnerable. Our, my top priorities will be housing and homelessness, um, uh, climate and environmental protection, and the social safety net as well. Uh, I have been, I've spent the last over 20 years as an advocate, both in the climate change and environmental protection space, as well as in the social justice space as the executive director of Equality California. And I would say that I um, have been working with legislators, uh, not as a legislator, but as an advocate, basically advocating for change, um, building hearts, uh, build, uh, changing hearts and minds and building the kind of consensus that we need to make progress on all of the issues that we care about. Thank you. Okay, since uh, we know that homelessness is one of the chief concerns of our voters and um, given that a lot of housing and homelessness programs are dealt with locally, uh, I guess, one question would be, when you're in the assembly, what you feel the legislature can do better from Sacramento to help us with homelessness here in, in the district. So let's start with Rick. So first of all, um, you know, I think our structures of government are not working. I think we have a lot of well-intentioned people and obviously our government is failing us. 
Um, I look at this from the perspective of someone who actually had a family member who was unhoused for seven years, and I understand really sort of the holes and the gaps in the system. Um, anyone who basically says that um, this is all about people that don't um, want to be housed um, is just wrong. Um, I actually had a family member who every time we had an opportunity to try to get um, him into mental health services and substance use services, the wait lists were, were months long and we could never get them in. I just met a woman who was unhoused on my street the other day who went into the county and could not get rent assistance. She, had, she was living in her car with her child and was told that she couldn't get support because she was not, she didn't qualify because she was not among the most vulnerable. This is a person who had lost her job um, about three weeks ago and had been evicted from her home and couldn't get help from the county when she is probably one of the people that we should be helping first because we know that um, that you know the mental health issues and the substance use issues in many cases are caused. So I think that we really need to be working with our local officials. We need to look at um, how we can reframe the structures of government to basically provide leadership on this issue. We need to be funding transition shelters more and uh, social and um, uh, wraparound services more. Um, and we need to figure out how to reduce. Um, the cost of building new uh, shelters. I look at sort of what's happening in the Ukraine now, and I see how Poland and Romania have housed two million people. In the, uh, have two million people in the last two weeks, and how is it that we can't house sixty-six thousand people? It's because we don't have the will to do it, um, and because our government structures are broken. And that's one of the things that I want to work on when I get to Sacramento. Thank you, Willis. Okay, here's what I want to do what the state can do. We need housing goals for each municipality for wraparound uh, units with wraparound services for people with serious mental illness. Project Home Key will fund these. LA County was offers, offered the opportunity to buy board and care facilities, which are the only ones appropriate for people with serious mental illness. Didn't do it. The state should make sure that they do next time. We need uniform permitting standards across the state so it doesn't cost LA 10 times as much as Riverside to build those tiny homes that are so critical. We need to co-locate all of our social services that touch unhoused folks on DMV campuses. Those are state assets. And it's not good that someone who's experiencing homeless has to run to the DMV to get an ID, DPSS downtown to get their welfare check and their uh, EBT. They've got to go to city services to get their tickets cleared. They've, that is the governance problem that Rick was so accurately describing. The state can put those assets on the same place. So there's closer to one-stop shopping. Uh, we need to fund crisis response teams in every single community so that teams of mental health professionals and social workers appear in two minutes when you're in trouble or you see someone else in trouble, not two hours like LAPD, which is the wrong resource, or two months like with LASA, which is another governance issue. Uh, we need to bundle one. all of the money for affordable housing into one stream, not six, so that it's easier for the people who build those critical subsidized res resources to do it. They don't have to spend 700,000 bucks a pot. Um, we also need to make sure we're paying attention to staffing because we can spend $12 billion on motel rooms till the cows come home, but people won't stay in them unless they get the support that they need. We need to be funding the people who are putting folks in, uh, who are serving folks once they're in that housing. I work directly with them in Hollywood. They are bleeding people. We need to stop that. And if this takes standing up a department 30. of homelessness in the state, it's in the state, we to do it. I'm in favor of it. Thank you. On to another subject. Um, a big subject, but a simple question. What is your position on single payer health care in California? Start with Lewis. I'm for it. Good. How about you, Rick? How would you fund it? <laughs> I think that's a great question. So I think the road to single payer and whether or not we have to do it in one stop, obviously, I was disappointed to see AB 1400 fail. Um, I think there's a good, you know, the way that it was talked about during the last presidential cycle was standing up a public option. And if the public option is competitive and good, people will get into it, which will add purchasing power to, uh, to the public stream, which will ultimately sort of move its way into naturally a single payer system. It's a little bit slower. I know it's too slow given what we're seeing, um, but uh, something where there is, some, so that kind of a progression I think would be good. Um, I, obviously, the funding is a big question. Right now, it's worth noting, by the way, that right now, it's possible that as many as 50% of Californians are already on something like uh, a, not a single payer system, but a public option system. 35% of Californians are on Medi-Cal, uh, and another, few, another percentage, probably 15 or 20, are on Medicare. So it's not a huge leap. It's not like a factor of 10 we've got to scale up. It is a factor of some, and we, and we need to think hard about this. So I am not yet right. Uh, as familiar with the funding mechanisms okay. that the state legislature might design, I'm sure we have the creativity to do it. That isn't just um, a massive tax hike, 
I'm in favor of exploring that. And if also we have to move on a more gradual path through a public option, I'm for that too. Thank you. Rick, are you for it? And if so, how to pay? Uh, I am for it. And uh, I think obviously we need a federal waiver to sort of pull the federal funds into the system, obviously. And that is, um, and then, you know, also I think um, one of the reasons why I think we, you know, AB 1400 failed is because we actually haven't gotten the funding mechanism right. And, and a lot of the funding proposals have been viewed by Democrats and progressive Democrats who support single payer as being regressive. Uh, we need to make sure that the funding that replaces employer paid for health care is not regressive. That's why I don't support a sales tax. I, I don't support a sales tax with a rebate because that forces poor people who may not even have to um, uh, uh, file their income taxes to file for that. And that's a barrier. Um, I don't like, um, I think probably some kind of employment related tax is probably the best way. Um, it goes against single payers theory, uh, sort of dive, you know, divesting healthcare from employment, but most of the other uh, funding mechanisms are either regressive or drive business out of the state. So I think that's probably the best funding Fine. mechanism. Uh, I would say that there's some other things that need to be in a single payer bill though. Um, at Equality California, we got calls all the time about people that face problems getting their prescription drugs and other medical care from Medi-Cal and Medicare. Uh, especially their HIV drugs. We need consumer protections as part of this program. Um, and that's uh, one of the things that I've been talking to Ash Kalra about and needs to be an important um, component of the program. And then last but not least, uh, we need to deal with the equity issues that basically people get their, who get their health care through um, th uh, from negotiated through unions and have given up pay increases. We need to basically, there's ways of doing it, but we need to basically deal with that equity issue as we move to single payer. Thank you. Uh, speaking of raising money for funding, um, Californians are already paying very high taxes. It says here the fourth highest tax burden in the US. Can you share your thoughts about Proposition 13 and other taxes? Do we need to, do we overtax individuals and corporations? Does our tax system need reform? Rick, why don't you start? We do need, our tax system does need reform. And in fact, I think well, that's gonna be one of the big challenges and one of the big picture challenges that I think um, you know, legislators that are being elected now are gonna to have to face over the next 10 years. Um, our tax system is really broken. Um, it results in boom and bust revenues for the state that is not good for us. It's not good for public education. It means we throw money at problems for short periods of time rather than having long-term solutions to our programs where you have dependability. Um, I, I do think that we need to do more to tax the uh, tax uh, folks at the higher income streams. I think we need to be looking at our corporate tax rates. Um, we're going to need to find a replacement for the gas tax. I mean, as we move off of fossil fuel cars and to electric vehicles, uh, we still are going to need roads and stuff for, you know, payment for infrastructure. That tax revenue base is going to decline over time and we need to find a replacement for it. And we need to also fund millions of electric charging stations. We need to figure out how we're going to end up uh, paying to help people move One. from gas to electric appliances and you know, millions of homes across California. I can afford to do that. But, you know, when we've got um, uh, almost, uh, you know, a third of our folks living in the poverty or above poverty, folks are not going to be able to afford to do that. Um, so I think, you know, I think our wholesale restructuring of our uh, system is placed. We do need to be look more on property taxes. Equality California was a strong proponent of Prop 15 last cycle. Um, and we do really do need to fix Prop 13 and that Pardon. is a component of it. Thank you. I think I largely, if not entirely, agree with Rick on these issues. I mean, certainly uh, I was also in favor of eliminating Prop 13 for commercial properties as on the last, that was Prop 15, on the last ballot. Uh, how to structure that um, so that we're protecting folks who, uh, you know, how to make sure that it's Disney and Amazon and Google who are paying their fair share and we're not overburdening these on folks who are, you know, who just have small businesses who were just whacked by the pandemic is something we'll have to think about hard, but there's a rollout based on uh, value of business and all sorts of creative solutions like that. I'm sure we can figure that out. Uh, and yes, as we do that, I think we will have to take, we should consider doing that in a holistic context where we are backing off from some of the uh, regressive sales tax uh, metrics or even income taxes uh, for, for middle-class middle uh, Californians to make sure we're not sort of 
overburdening, you know, we want to make sure we have the income we need to fund all the things we need. And I do believe more of that will come in more smoothly and therefore enable us to do long range planning, make sure, as Rick was saying, our schools are properly sustained, not just this year, uh, but for, you know, decades. Uh, if we move from, yes, sort of income tax to property tax based funding. This is most evident to me in mental health, uh, with the Mental Health Services Act, which funds, which is a millionaire's tax. If you watch how that thing jumps around, I mean, if you're a provider and you're trying to get innovation dollars to scale up these critical mental health uh, interventions that we so desperately need to provide job support and peer support and housing, you can't plan around that. And so all the, you know, a lot of it's moving to the private, uh, well, not the third sector to nonprofit folks. Um, but this is really services the government should be provided. And, and I'm in favor of a holistic review of our income, our revenue stream so that we can enable those things to happen. Thank you. Um, and speaking of, um gas tax and electric cars, while we wait for electric cars to become a reality, um, I'd like to ask you about public transportation. Yeah. Um, how do you get people to feel safer using public transportation when they can afford to drive? And um, a related question, if we can cram it in, is how do you feel about the high-speed rail project? This is personal. I gave up my car and really relied on public transportation for a few years. And uh, I'm not fearful, but there are all kinds of people there. Am so I? Okay. How would you get people to use it? Okay, great. So let me let me just state at the beginning of my position is pro high speed rail. I think we would we, we I would take it. I mean, man, taking a train to, in two hours or three hours to get from LA to San Francisco, fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, I think, so there's research that shows that like highways, um, public transit has what's called induced demands, which means if you build more of it, more people will use it. Uh, I wanna provide cities with state matching dollars to put more buses and trains on existing lines. Now this is different from filling out our public transit network, which we need to do desperately as well. Don't get me wrong, but cities can raise that money. They tend to be able to raise capital costs for that money through, uh, you know, through bond initiatives. They, they find it much harder to put more buses and trains on, on existing lines uh, because it's not as shiny. Now, why is this important? Well, one of the reasons that I don't take public transit as much as I want to is because I have to plan around it. If I go to the bus stop uh, you know, at Santa Monica or Sunset, the next bus might be coming in half an hour. These overheads are so long that it's not, it's not convenient to use public transit. One, having, having lived in New York and Chicago, I know how critical um, convenience is. And so as we add capacity to these lines, we will increase throughput, which will mean you won't have to plan around, you know, doing what you want to do. You can just show up, next bus will come in five minutes, not half an hour. And I think that's really going to make this more appealing for, for everyday folks. I hope this will make it more appealing for you, Julie. It certainly would make it more appealing for me. I was all for it. Until COVID. And privileged enough to be able to start driving a car again. Uh, Rick. So I am strongly in favor of high speed rail, and I've written op eds that appeared in this, I think the Sacramento Bee and the LA Times uh, in favor of it when Governor Brown was um, uh, in office. I continue to be in favor of it. Um, I think we have to understand that high speed rail is not a commuter line, and in order for it to be effective, it needs to be a straight line, have very few stops, and go in a straight line. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that is a, a component of our public transportation system and would compete with um, with air, which is, of course, much more low carbon emitting than um, than you know taking uh, airplanes. Um, I don't disagree with anything that Louis said. Frankly, I think he's right on on you know his uh, take on all of this stuff. I mean, the reason why people don't use public transit is because it does not go enough places yet. It's not as convenient, and it does and it takes more time than um, traveling in your car still. Um, and I think we have to continue working on that to make sure that we're building out our public transit systems because we need to basically get people into public transit and we need One. to by creating the demand for it. Um, the, um, you know, attack, tackling climate change uh, is going to require us to use public transit more um, and also, um, you know, also uh, accomplish Governor uh, Newsom's goal of, um, of getting into electric cars by 2035. And there's a lot that we have to do between now and then to do that and continuing to fund transit, continuing to figure out how we're gonna actually get electric charging stations in every single community. 30. 
and they've got to be fast chargers. We have people that park on the street and live in apartment buildings where we can't actually put a charger in a, you know, every single driveway. So we need fast chargers and we need to figure out how we're going to do that and how we're going to fund that. And that is basically billions of dollars. And hopefully we're going to be able to um, take a look at the, um, you know, the money that's coming from the federal government now and we'll use that wisely. Thank you. Um, so you brought up climate change. I don't know if this is too vague a question, but what can we do in the legislature and the assembly to better fight, fight global warming? Um, what could be a strategy for this? Rick? So I think we need to have a, an all of government approach on climate change. I mean, we need to view every decision that the government makes through the lens of climate change. And it basically almost everything we do impacts climate change. So it's, you know, we need to get off of fossil fuels. We, uh, I heard some of the, the debate in the past, you know, in the last uh, issue about whether or not we should be drilling more. No, we shouldn't be drilling more in California. These are long-term things. We need to be drilling less and we need to get off of fossil fuels. We need to get off of, uh, we need to move to a clean energy economy and we need to do that as rapidly as possible. Um, we have to, we, we, we need to, connect our transmission grids from Northern and Southern California. And so as hard as that is to do, um, we've got to figure out how to do that quickly and do that in a way where we're not harming sensitive habitats. And that is really the, the difficulty in that. Every time we build something, these long line things, there's, you know, there's resources that, and species that we actually have to pay attention to. So we've got to figure out how to do that, um, but also do it faster. Um, I support- uh, One. I support offshore wind. We need to figure out how to accelerate that. And we need to figure out how we're gonna keep the jobs to build all that wind in the state of California. And that's part of um, a just um, economy. Um, we need to think about water. Um, water is part of this. We pump a lot of water from Northern to Southern California. It harms the ecosystems in Northern California, pumping so much water. And it is a big uh, part of the carbon um, that we use. We need to look at agriculture um, and really more sustainable agriculture that is lower carbon. 30. Um, uh, really almost everything we do, right, has carbon impacts. And as we make decisions on every, um, we need to figure out how to embed a climate lens in every decision. I keep saying mm -hmm. we need an all of government approach to tackling climate change. And I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, California is a small part of the global emissions pie, but we have a huge role because we can show the rest of the country how we can do this and really sort of have a strong economy and really improve the lives of our people here and really tackle climate change. Uh, that is, that's one of my priorities. Thank you. Lewis. So I think we have to cut this problem into a couple of pieces. First is direct versus indirect climate intervention. So obviously, yeah, the direct climate interventions are things like scaling wind, uh, yeah, getting modernizing our grid. One of the things I wanna do there is make sure that every house with a solar panel on its roof has a battery that's connected to the grid so that we can store the excess solar we're generating right now and actually dumping in the middle of the day and then distribute it to all of our communities so that everybody's getting green energy. But the indirect stuff is really important. So I wanna talk about jobs for a second. This district has the fifth highest job count of all 80 assembly districts. We've got 360,000 jobs. We rank, like I said, we rank fifth. We rank 69th on how many people who hold those jobs live in this district. So 20% of our workforce, 20%, so four out of five people who hold those jobs don't live in this district. And they don't live in this district because they can't afford to live in this district. And of, you know, it's roughly 50% of people commute more than 10 miles to their jobs, 20% commute more than 25. You know, we've got people coming in from as far as, you know, Lancaster and Palmdale, absolutely, even Riverside County. They're driving. And as they're driving, they're paying $5 per gallon One. for the privilege of doing it. And they're emitting carbon into our air, also traffic to our streets, also causing accidents that are killing people. So we have to talk about housing here. There's no way around it. It's the number, the, the number one thing we could do from the Berkeley Climate Local Government Tool is reduce vehicle miles traveled. And the way we do that is enabling more jobs to be built near more, uh, sorry, more homes to be built near more jobs. And there's already a lot of incentives to make sure that happens along commercial corridors. Um, but I, I fear that if we don't welcome new neighbors into our high opportunity 30. communities, uh, we're not gonna get where we wanna go on this. Santa Monica imports 90% of its labor force. And I think we're really gonna have to figure out how many more of those workers who bring us their labor, their energy, their ideas to give us economic vibrancy can become our neighbors. And if we don't do that, we're not gonna see long-term gains on the climate. Thank you. Um, Rick mentioned water. I, I wonder um, if 
you could comment, I mean, about our drought water management as opposed to the carbon question mm -hmm. and um, what solutions you see for, for this problem, given that, of course, we have the most important agriculture industry in the country. So, uh, Louis, why don't you just start? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is obvious. This is a, a great question. And I, I've been talking to some folks on the water board about it. So, you know, I, I was very interested in desalination when I first heard about it, but I have learned uh, that that's actually not where the thinking of a lot of experts is. A lot of this is about water recycling and stormwater capture and making sure that we're, we're, we're like we know with trash, that we're, we're, we're not just using water as if it was a one-shot deal, that we're making sure we're maximizing our use of, 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 of water every time we touch it. So every time we can capture uh, rain, every time we can make sure we're recycling water that we've used um, before in our homes, uh, that's what they see as, the, as the, 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 the biggest return on investment short-term project for the state. And I'm not, um, I, I'm not an expert in all of the different modes that they are thinking about doing this uh, for, but this is sort of the avenue of exploration I, I think seems most ripe for our thinking. Um, I'm, I mean, yes, the drought is, 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 is terrible. And um, it's, uh, you know, we haven't been talking about this one as much as we did the last drought in 2017, was it? Um, but it's, it's obviously terrible. And there's, one science, minute. there's science that says, you know, this is, we're returning to the mean, that this is more like the average historically on geological timescales in this part of the world. And perhaps LA was founded during a wet spell. So this question is only gonna gain importance and um, I'm, as a scientist, obviously committed uh, to figuring out the absolute best, highest, uh, you know, uh, uh, most, uh, most uh, cutting edge solutions for it. Thank you. Ray? Uh, I don't disagree with anything that uh, Louis says. I'm surprised we're running against each other. Um, I, um, uh, I think the thing that I would sort of add to this is that we really de do need to focus in addition to what he said on um, the ag sector, which continues to use enormous amounts of water uh, that is not necessary to, 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 you know, to grow the food that we need. Um, we, you know, some of that is I think about building consensus in the ag industry, uh, really sort of sitting down and making progress there. It's gonna be hard work, but we need to do it because um, it's, you know, we're, we're pumping tons of water into the Central Valley that we don't need and that is a huge, uh, has a huge carbon impact. Uh, the other thing I would say is conservation, 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 in addition to stuff that Louis is talking about. I mean, I, I come from New Mexico and Albuquerque, New Mexico, they actually um, you know, get most of their water from groundwater aquifers. And they found that the city, the, you know, the, the elevation of the city had dropped by something like 60 feet over the course of 15 years from over pumping the aquifer. And so they were forced to put in uh, conservation programs that when you look at it compared to what we do here in Southern California is, um, you know, is incredibly different. So whenever people say we're doing everything on conservation, um, conservation needs to be more than just basically raising rates, having deferential interest uh, rates. We need to have programs to um, convince people to seroscape. We need to continue looking at our building codes to make sure that we're basically continuing to make progress on low water use a lot of that, some of that stuff has been done, but not enough. Uh, and there's still more progress we can make in that area. Thank you. Um, so I'm getting a little concerned about our time, but I did want to just to quickly address that one local issue that Marsha Hanscom asked us about um, the proposed quote unquote restoration project for the Biona wetlands. Wait, um, sorry again, Julie. Oh, okay, do we not have time? No, we do have time, uh, if you all don't mind, because um, of all the ballots sent, only five have been opened so far. So uh, you all have, I just extended it until 1.30 because we don't want to just have five people voting in this election. I think people were respecting what I said. Um, I hope Nick Malvoin is here. And then when we finish- Yes, we'll he's here. And then we'll get to Nick. So yeah, let's do the Biona and then we'll do the two minutes. We can do the we can do the 10 word or less wrap up. Just kidding. Um, I did get my ballot. Okay. Uh, so yes, so I don't remember who was starting for the Biona wetlands. Was it Lewis? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I, oh, so this restoration project, do you agree with the Democratic Party's position opposing it? If you do agree, what will you do to stop the flow of money and persuade the state to withdraw the proposed project? More than $12 million in bond money has already been spent just to plan it. That's the full question. Um, 
Could you comment, please? Uh, I, 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 if my understanding of this project is correct, there would be some measure of destruction of this natural resource of the Bayona wetlands. And if my understanding is correct, I therefore do oppose it. Um, but this is not an, you know, this is an issue that I look forward for working with this club to partner with and learn more about. Like I say, I am a scientist, so I come at all of these questions um, through em empiricism. I, I, I like to have data in front of me to understand the impacts of uh, what measure, what action X is going to impact the values that we hold Y and Z. Um, you know, if the, we were talking about CEQA earlier, I heard briefly, like the kind of places we want to protect with that law are like the Bayona wetlands. And so um, looking at this through that lens, looking at this through community impacts from uh, uh, neighbors uh, are all things I'd be, I'd be keen to, to do. Um, and I'm very open and would be eager to be your student for it. So I'm afraid I don't have very much to say of great uh, profundity here, but that's my stance. Thank you, Rick. I don't support it. Um... I actually, unfortunately, uh, Marsh and I were supposed to have a tour of the uh, the wetlands, uh, which we is I think happening in a week or two. So um, I know I'm going to be get, having a better understanding of the impact of that. But um, you know, I I really do um, support continuing to protect those ecosystems in Biona wetlands. Um, I think partnering with the stewards of the wetlands over um, who've been working on this for decades now. Um, you know, that is a really, it's a sensitive ecosystem that is still needs work to sort of restore it. Um, but the restoration that I think that, that, um, uh, that, you know, is proposed is I think not what sort of the stewards of the wetlands have been advocating. And um, uh, I would be um, aligning with them. Thank you. So do we go to ask you to wrap up at this point and will people have enough time to vote? I'm going to extend it another 15 minutes. All right. Okay. And all you guys, I'm so sorry, but it we just get into these wonderful answers. We gave much more time than we usually no, do. No, it's been so it's really been interesting. I, I have to say, you two are wonderful. I mean, <laughs> really, I mean, what a choice! I, I again, know. it's one of these embarrassments of riches. Oh dear. Okay. I, I'm just going to have to think about how LA was founded during a wet period. That is such a strange concept to me. Okay, so let's do the wrap up for each <laughs> okay. of you. I know that Louis has to go as well. So let okay. me end the voting. Um, okay. okay, so we started with A. Let's start with Z. Rick, would you wrap it up, please? Yeah, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for Louis and Louis, thank you for joining today. I always enjoy these, uh, the time when we were able to spend together. Um, and I would basically say, um, the reason why I hope to earn your support is that I do think, just like I believe that facts matter and science matters, I also think that experience matters. And I think what I would say is that I have two decades of experience, not working as an insider, um, but working, uh, you know, knocking on the doors of elected officials at every level of government and changing hearts and minds to try to build consensus and make progress. Well, as a, both out of Quality California and California environmental voters. I'm proud that I am endorsed by the California Democratic Party, every Democratic club that's endorsed in the race so far, um, every uh, member of the, uh, every statewide elected official, Governor Newsom and every other official, statewide elected official below him, all four of the Democrats on the Board of Supervisors. I'm endorsed by California environmental voters, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, um, the Progressive Caucus, the LGBT Caucus, the Latino Caucus, um, uh, I think 30 or 40 legislators now, um, all of the elected officials that sort of cover the area, including uh, Richard Bloom and Ben Allen and um, Ted Lieu. Um, and the reason why they're, they, they, you know, it's not because I'm important. In fact, frankly, I have a hard time getting into see most of them in the same way you all do, but it's because I've been knocking at the door and I've been working on all these issues in the trenches for many, many years. And I think that that experience is uh, experience that's important. And I think um, part of making progress in all of these things is really changing hearts. 30 seconds. Thank you, where we have divisions in our community, really trying to bring people together. And when we can't bring people together, being bold and basically sticking to our values. And I think I have a record of accomplishment and a record of progressive activism that you can look to, uh, to feel confident that the values that you share are the ones that I'll be advancing as a member of the legislature. So thank you all very much. Thank you for taking time on a Saturday afternoon to spend time uh, with me and Lewis. Okay, Lewis, thank you. And thanks, Rick. Thanks for the kind words. I also enjoy this. Um, okay, so experience. Here's my experience. This morning, I was with the mayor uh, 
delivering food to senior citizens, which is a continuation of an effort that when COVID hit, I led that ended up bringing 32,000 pounds of food to 700 seniors, uh, some of whom I called. The senior I mentioned uh, who had AIDS in his car was one of the people I called when COVID hit. I called women uh, who were struggling to in, in fights with their daughters over whether or not to take their psychiatric medicine. Uh, I led a homeless count when LA County said it couldn't last year. My knocking on doors has been on my, with my neighbors and 1,200 doors in the Antelope Valley or more with Katie Hill's campaign working on that. I think a lot about coalitions and one of the nonprofits I've helped found in Hollywood has been explicitly to build coalitions between the business community, lay residents, homelessness services providers to come to one stance as a community on what we need to, to address our most critical crisis. So, you know, experience, my experience is in my community. I've been endorsed by over 50 community leaders. I've been endorsed by a Nobel prize winner. I've been endorsed by the, the national fund that elects, that helps scientists get elected. I've been endorsed by the former mayor of Culver City. But I am in this for one simple reason. And that's that the day after Trump elected, I was sitting on my bed crying, thinking about my grandfather. My grandfather stormed Omaha Beach in World War II. And the day after Trump's election, I was one year older than him, almost exactly. And I'd been an astrophysicist and I'd had my head in the clouds for seven years. And I said, Grandpa, you know what? I might not reduce injustice in this 30, world by half as much as you did. 30 seconds. But I am going to take some time out from looking up and I'm going to look around me. And if I've done one brave thing in my life, it's that I followed through on that promise. And I am before you today to say, I'm going to keep following through on that promise for my community, for your community, and for everybody else up and down this state. I think you got two great choices in front of you. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward uh, to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you both. Over to Kara. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> I know, uh, this has been great. I mean, good luck, you two. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what to say. You can't say may the best uh, man win because hey, you're both excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to hop right over to Nick Melvoin, who is our current uh, representative on uh, uh, LAUSD uh, District 4 um, at Los Angeles Unified School District. That is, where is, where is um, Nick Melvoin? Michelle? I am right here. Michelle, did you find? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so, so, uh, It'll be Nick just a minute. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find him. Okay, Nick. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if waving like this actually yeah, helped. Right? It did help. Hi. It did help. Yeah. So, so Nick is. Uh, it represents us. He has. Um. Uh, he has a couple of opponents in this race. None of them a Democrat. So I think, uh, at least from the Democratic uh, voters, which are most of us, um, I think you have a great shot. Have tell us a little about yourself. Um, you have uh, about seven minutes and then um, we'll vote. We'll, or as you know, I just, I had to extend the voting to actually 145, you guys. So, but as soon as all the ballots are in, they will close the voting or I can close it if I see no one else is going to vote. So take it away, Nick. Thank you. It's great to see all of you. Um, and it was great to, to be on uh, to hear some of those conversations. I look forward to working with whomever wins in both of those assembly races that you've been de um, deliberating today as my district goes from Westchester all the way to Woodland Hills and from the ocean to the Hollywood Hills. It's hard to believe that it's been five years since you know we were all together in person, I think, when I first ran. Um, and I'm proud uh, in glutton for punishment though I may be running for another term on the LA Unified Board. I'm proud to be running as the only Democrat in the race, um, having received the endorsement recently of the LA County Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO, SEIU Local 99, the Teamsters, Mayor Garcetti, Assembly Member Richard Bloom, Senator Allen, Assembly Member uh, Laura Friedman, who I know was with you earlier today. And I'm eager to talk a little bit just about the work we've done on the board um, over these five years, which has included a superintendent transitions, a teacher strike, of course, our pandemic, some of my vision for the future, and then answer any questions. I know it's been a long day for you all uh, as well, so I'll try not to be too long-winded, but you know, I ran uh, as a former LAUSD teacher. I grew up in West LA, went to Cantor Canyon Elementary, and then began my career teaching middle school in Watts at the LAUSD campus. Uh, and that journey, uh, this journey that I'm on today, began there when I saw the potential of our school district, but the challenges. Um, and so actually after suing LAUSD on behalf of my students and their right to quality education, 
I went to law school, spent some time working the Obama administration on a team that didn't exist for the last four years, but does again called Justice and Regulatory Policy, uh, the liaison to the Department of Justice at the White House. I came back to LA um, where I continue to run a nonprofit camp for homeless kids and started organizing parents and teachers around school uh, improvement and then got elected to the board in May of 2017. Um, I ran on a platform of decentralizing, cutting the bureaucracy, of bringing more resources and investments to our schools. And I'm really proud of the work we've done despite the craziness of this, of this term. We have uh, broken up the, the district into 44 communities of schools, including the West LA community. So the idea is to feel like it's its own mini district with less bureaucracy and less red tape. We have reinvested in our schools. We led, um, I helped lead the passage of our bond last year. Measure RR was the largest school bond in the country. $7 billion that was passed by 70% of voters. So thank you all for your support that are enabling us to do a state of the art uh, comprehensive modernization of Venice High that was just um, completed. I've just selected iconic Fairfax High School for the site of the next one uh, on the greater west uh, side area. We have invested in dual immersion programs, which I'm a big believer in. We now have in my district dual immersion pathways in Mandarin, in Korean, in French, in Spanish, and in the fall at Noristeri Elementary on Sautel in West LA, we're opening a dual immersion Japanese program. We open a college savings account. We worked with the city and the county. We are opening a savings account for every first grader in the city of Los Angeles, putting $50 in an account for many of these families. It's the first time they've had a savings account and we're investing in their future. We're putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to all kids being college and career ready. We have expanded uh, preschool education. We have increased green space. Uh, I've been a big proponent of removing asphalt, removing bungalows, putting in garden programs. I was just at Emerson Middle School on the west side uh, last week with Tommaso Grady of Enrich LA, who was at Marina Del Rey Middle School yesterday, as we're uh, after years of neglect, reinvesting uh, in that garden community. Um, we have worked to expand pre-K uh, and reopen early education centers like Kentwood uh, in Westchester that now has uh, a, an open preschool site that has been shuttered for years. And we've been working with the state and with our partners in Washington to make sure that not only can every kid have a great education starting at age five, but at age four and age three. I'm really proud that this board unanimously just brought on a new superintendent, Alberto Carvalho, who comes to us after 14 years at the helm of Miami. Um, the, the Dean of the USC Education School, Pedro Nogueira, said it was like LeBron James coming to the Lakers. I think he said that before the Lakers current performance, but you know, I'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and I just wanna spend a moment talking about COVID because it was two years almost exactly to the day that we shut down the school system. And I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about why we did it before New York City had even closed their schools. And the, at the time it was the right decision to make sure we were protecting our students and our employees. And I'm really proud of the work we've did over COVID. We uh, closed schools on a Friday and by Wednesday, we were operating what became the largest school-based food relief effort in American history. We served over 150 million meals to students and their families and any adult who showed up to a school district. Uh, facility over the course of the worst of the pandemic. We then almost immediately uh, bought out every iPad, every Chromebook in the state of California. We struck a deal with Verizon that became the basis of a nationwide contract to make sure every kid had computer, iPad, hotspot because of the need for internet. We basically became our own internet service provider. We then, when we realized that so many students were living with their siblings in maybe a one bedroom apartment and they needed other things like headphones. So we got free headphones for every kid. Then we had to figure out how to train our, uh, our teachers on virtual learning. We also made the decision early on as one of the largest employers, if not the largest employer in the county, to not lay off one employee during the pandemic, expand healthcare coverage for our part-time workers. And we're proud that we haven't had to lay off any employees during, during COVID. We then launched what is still the largest school-based COVID testing program in America, uh, which led a few months ago for the Washington Post to do an article saying that LAUSD is the safest schools in the nation. We also then were one of the first districts, definitely the first large district to put in place a vaccination mandate for employees and students to make sure that we could keep schools open safely. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've done over the last five years. I am running for a second term on the board because the work's not um, completed. We still have to make sure that that's fine, Car. Uh, we still, we still have to make sure 
that every kid in every neighborhood has a strong neighborhood traditional public school pathway from pre-K all the way through college and career. Um, and that's that work continues. We've been able to invest in our school district, but we have this one time infusion of resources. We need to extend it. We did uh, advocate unsuccessfully, but for the passage of Measure EE, which would have been a school parcel tax, but we need to really put our money where our mouth is. When I was growing up in California, California was one of the best funded states in terms of per people. Um, now we're near the bottom. We have this kind of uh, odd situation right now where you have this infusion of one-time dollars, but we need the state and our assembly members, whoever they may be, to invest in making sure that we're leading the nation in terms of our per pupil funding. And that we're also doing it equitably. You know, I'll end on this, but LA Unified um, it serves 84% of kids in poverty. We have more homeless students in LAUSD than most districts have students total. And, in, uh, and we have incredible resources for them. I actually just passed a resolution welcoming Afghan refugee students. And just this last week in our Westchester schools at Westport Heights and at Mark Twain, uh, Orville Wright in Westchester, we enrolled 30 uh, Afghan refugee families. Um, we of course need resources to help their families. And that's what LA Unified does because I really do believe as was my family's case coming to this country as Jewish refugees from, from Poland that Public schools are the best elevator we have out of poverty and for opportunity. And we're doing a lot of great work at LAUSD in partnership with you all and our local communities. And there's more work to be done. So I, I do, I am the only Democrat in the race. I have two folks, two Republicans, anti-vax, uh, who want to roll back a lot of the health protections that we put in place. Um, so I do hope to earn your support uh, and also hope to earn your vote in June uh, on June 7th. So thank you, Carr, for the quick invitation. Happy to answer some questions, but I also know you have a lot of work to do. So I don't want to be too loquacious. And now you're on mute. I know I'm. It's this ballot thing back and forth. You know, every so many people write and say, "I didn't get my ballot." Look in your junk. Look in your spam. Blah blah blah. You know, it, it does get figured out. Um, yes. Yeah, so there are a few questions. Can you see the chat, uh, Nick? I can. I can. And um, Rick, it's great. To, oh, Rick, I guess left. But I was going to say it was great to see Rick. Um, yes, I can. Let's see the most recent uh, savings accounts for kids vouchers. Okay. So yes, thank you for letting me explain. Uh, I do not support vouchers. Uh, and these are the college savings accounts that we've done with the city and with the county and the state. Actually, Governor Newsom is now doing a statewide savings account initiative are different than the flexible savings account, the 527s for vouchers. So thank you, Sarah. It's good to see, see you virtually um, uh, for, the, for the question. I do not support vouchers. We need to invest in public schools in this state and in this country. What we've done for these uh, first graders is savings accounts that they can use only for higher education um, that are enabling them to invest uh, that money in higher ed, whether that's for Cal State or UC. Um, and so they can't use that for their K-12 education. That's one of the main reasons that they're different. They, the uh, idea is also to have incentive structures built in throughout their tenure. So perfect attendance in fourth grade, you get a few extra bucks. It's also an opportunity for other scholarship uh, programs throughout a child's tenure to be able um, to invest in these savings accounts. Because like I said, with our, our demographic, 84% of kids in poverty, many of these families don't have bank accounts. And so in doing this for families, we're enabling them to invest. I just did a webinar with Betsetic and a few other agencies last week on, um, on uh, the child savings uh, tax credit and in really encouraging these families, many of whom don't file taxes because they, they don't have anything to pay to let them know about these refundable credits. So uh, we can talk more offline. I, I definitely agree that we need to find these higher ed entities properly. Um, if I were in the legislature, I would be funding uh, all of our UC and Cal State systems because we see how difficult it is. I brought a resolution that the board passed unanimously a few months ago requiring the completion of the FAFSA, uh, which is the federal application for student loans in order to graduate because we need to get more money into the pockets of our families. But I also agree, uh, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. We need to fund higher ed so that it's free for every kid in California. Um, there's some more questions in the chat if you want to address any of them. Yeah, let's see, why do you support, and hi Rose, and nice to see you as well, or you know, know that you're on here. Um, I have been saying consistently since, the, since we, um, made the decision to close schools two years ago that we're going to follow the public health experts. LUSD is many things. Like I said, we were the food bank for the city. Uh, we are a testing provider, but we're not a healthcare entity. We, we've been deferring to the county and to the state. 
Um, we were actually later uh, than many districts in opening schools because we had to make sure we had those safe standards in place, that we had the testing, that we had negotiations with our unions. Um, but it was only after both the state, uh, the CDC, and the county said it was safe to open schools did we begin to gradually reopen schools. Um, and so I, I believe that we opened schools when it was safe because that's what our public health entities were telling us. Um, new AC for Pally High. Pally High is an interesting one. I know it, there's the Palisades Democratic Club and our local schools in, in um, West LA are more, are more Venice and are more Uni High, which has some wonderful things happening. Uni High has an over 95% graduation rate. Um, we have had astronomical growth there and some wonderful leadership. Pally High was a conversion charter way before my time. It was a district school. The faculty and families voted to convert. It's still owned by us. It is the local school for kids in the Pally area. Many of them go to our local elementary schools, Paul Revere, which is a district school, and then Pally, which is a charter. And so because we have so many kids there, it's one of the biggest high schools in the county. Um, when Pally was built, it didn't need air conditioning, as many of us remember growing up in LA. Revere is a uh, district charter. Revere is an affiliated charter, which means it's run by, yeah, this is a helpful, a helpful note. I know these questions are coming in the chat. Affiliated charters are run by LUSD and independent charters are run by uh, public nonprofits. And Pally is an independent charter, but it still is the neighborhood school for those kids. And so we've needed to put, um, to put air conditioning there. And I'll just say as a, as a plug, I didn't mention some of the environmental work that we're doing. Uh, LA Unified passed a resolution to go fully renewable by 2030. It's a shame that Pally High needs HVAC, that they need air conditioning in the Palisades in West LA. Um, that was not the case when they were built, but we need to make sure that when students are going there, it is their local home school, that of course they have air conditioning um, and, other, uh, and other basic necessities. Well, that, it, that same question said, um, but what about the schools in the Valley? Will they be getting yeah. the same consideration? Definitely, and I'm proud. I actually now with redistricting picked up Reseda. So we have a comprehensive modernization at Taft High School that we just broke ground on where we're, we're upgrading the school facilities, actually the athletic facilities. I also now have Reseda High School and SOSIS, the Sherman Oak Center for Enriched Studies that are both getting huge comprehensive modernizations. One of the reasons we brought this bond last year um, when other people, when people told us, you know what, probably not the best time to pass a school bond during COVID. We said, we think this is the right time. We need to invest in safety. We need to invest in upgrades. We passed measure RR. And so we have the resources to of course, make sure that there's uh, support um, in the Valley uh, and in uh, throughout, throughout LA, even not in my district, of course. So, and Rose and Sarah, you know how to reach me. I look forward to more conversations. It seems like we would maybe benefit from a coffee chat or a Zoom chat so we can go through uh, all of these schools. Uh, that school sounds, events. you know what? That sounds like a really good idea actually to sit down and because I know people have a lot of issues and I'm sure you have questions and answers yourself. So why don't we close it with you, Nick? And I really appreciate you coming around and. And having me finally, you know, say, yeah, come on, come on up. Yeah. Of course, I think, Cara, the last time I saw you in person was when we were running around LMU during the Democratic debate. Uh, oh, right. Debate. Like right, and you were so now. generous, right? <laughs> well, well, thank you. Well, like, so, so like I said, and, and uh, to Sarah and to Rose and to others, uh, I'm easy to find. Please reach out. I look forward to conversations. I'm really excited about where the district is headed with our new superintendent, with a board who's been really united around COVID health protocols around making sure that every student on the west side, in South LA where I taught, on the east side, in the valley which I represent, have great public school options, both the physical plants, but also their teachers and the opportunities that are open to them. So I do hope to have your support. Again, the only Democrat in the race was so thrilled to get the support of the County Federation of Labor, of our mayor, um, of our legislative delegation. We've all worked closely to um, try to put some of these long fights behind us and work collaboratively on behalf of kids in our, our community. So thank you. And I do look forward to when I can see you all in person. And, and please put your, um, your contact in the chat for everyone. I will do that. Yeah, thank you, Sammy, uh, my campaign manager, who will throw that there as well. But I will put my email. Okay. All right, everyone. So now we have, thank, thank you, so you so much. Thanks a lot, Nick. We'll see you around. See you around the campus. OK. <laughs> Okay, so um, now we've got all the candidates who have spoken. We have AD 62, soon to be AD 61, AD 51, which used to be AD 50, and uh, 
LAUSD number four, district four, which stays the same, even though it has had, uh, it's shifted a bit. So please get your ballots in. Um, I can check right now who still needs to get your ballot in if you like. It's so strange to be able to do this. Um, and if anybody, if anybody has anything to say, you can just unmute yourself and chat a bit, but let me just see who has, Okay, 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 okay. Oh, good. Uh, Mark Salzberg, vote please. Michelle Morton, vote please. Cheryl Turner, vote. Already please. voted. Mike Bonin, vote please. I don't think Bonin was here. Rose Rice, vote please. Sarah Roos, time to vote. Uh, Rick Zaber, I don't know if he. Mm, I think he left. He did, but he could vote. He has five minutes. I'll text him to vote. Jamie Kinnerk, I don't know if you're on. Um, let's see. Heidi, I don't think came on today. Carolyn Fowler, didn't see her. Murtaza, don't know. Lou Lamont, Lou was here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still here. Patricia Thompson. And that's it. So uh, all those who I called out, please vote in the next three minutes and then I will have the results. So this was great. I, I'm really happy about, uh, I'm happy about these forums. You know, I, I really learn a lot and I, I learned from the candidates, you know, and I, I, I think it's real interesting. You know, you go in, you have an idea, you might know people forever because I've been around this business here for a long time. Um, and I still learn new things, you know, when we ask these good questions and, and some of the answers, I'm like, wow, I did not know you had that opinion. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, I think these, these meetings are great. They're so helpful for the voting. And uh, yeah, you learn a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, anybody want to chime in on anything? Well, we just have such an embarrassment of riches, you know, so many wonderful candidates um, rare, you know, it, it does make it very difficult, you know, to decide, but, yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> yes. I know this will be interesting to see if anyone got an endorsement, you know, um, it's just, it's just, you like one candidate, someone else likes another candidate and then it goes on like that. So we don't know. Um, two minutes. Anyone else have anything to say while we're just sitting here? I could play some music. I, I think it was, um, I, I think it's a little odd, the Zabur Abramson um, uh, race, because they're really very um, supportive of each other. So I guess doing it over again, I just want to pose the question. So look, you guys know each other really well. <laughs> Tell us how you're different. Tell us how to distinguish and differentiate because they're very um, similar who, politically. Who, who's speaking? I'm sorry, this is Sarah. I don't know why it's not showing up. Sarah, Sarah Ruth? Ruth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it does seem that fundamentally they are very similar. Um, great idea. It looks like they both left. Yeah, they both had other events to go to, and uh, I appreciate them staying a little longer. Hi, Rick. I see you here. Did you hear me introduce you before? You're, you're muted. I think it's great, these forums. They're really educational. I thought Julie Goodman did a great job. I thought uh, Laura Friedman did a great job, and you do a great job. Oh, thanks, Rick. So you all know Rick Tuttle, former controller, and wonderfully wonderfully on it all the time you know he's he's here he's always at lacdp he always has something to say a question are you still on the candidate interview committee rick i beg your pardon are you still on the cic no i'm not i'm off i'm off that but it's a but i but like you you know we're i, I know you are and you've got a long weekend ahead of you uh very soon. Is that I know, I know. I'm really not looking forward to it. I'm yeah. hoping we can do the mayoral. I had to, uh, as I said, I had to change our mayoral from uh, the 26th, that, which I had everyone confirmed right. because you, I don't know when they're slotted. You know, they could be slotted in right when we're these, having it. So. These forums you're putting on, you, the, you and the club are putting, I think it's great. I, I agree <laughs> with you. I learn things and 
and the questions are great uh, yes. in the chat and also from individuals and and uh, yeah we work hard on these questions uh i do ask for input in all my emails from you know the people from our members and and guests and i do get some good questions and, and then go over them generally with the moderator and we'll spend we spend a lot of time i mean i know that andrea one that we spent like five hours on a friday night while she was driving back from somewhere just talking about these these questions you know and this is great stuff uh, this is and i thought marcia handsome's questions on this the wetlands very very important it's, it's a great, very big issue it is especially a, a, a big issue for us you know in art for the 62nd but you know what it affects everyone i mean it spills over into the 51st you know santa monica is it's the bay you know yeah. i mean uh i i think we all have to be aware and marcia does a great job of keeping us on track I, right. I do want to say that um let me check let me go to voting voting buddy now or election buddy and see what's What's going on if we have our results? Uh, not yet. Uh, not yet. Still waiting. This is kind of like uh, the Academy Awards, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe they sent me an email. No. Do you hear all these dings? This is a, oh yes, these dings are us discussing offline the disaster that is now our uh, our uh, website. Our website is down. Our website has been down now for a week. We're not sure whether we are victims of a scam we don't know what is going on but we're having a lot of trouble getting it back up and for us it's really disaster because we want to 